Morning, everybody. Welcome to Bath and North East Somerset March Planning Committee meeting. My name is Councillor Sue Craig. I'm Chair of the Planning Committee. Please, can I remind everybody to switch their phones, iPads, uh, anything else that might make a noise too silent? Um, I'd also like to tell you the meeting is being filmed. The recording will be available on the Council's website. Anybody speaking who does not wish to be filmed should make themselves known to the camera operators at the front of the room. Thank you. Could I now ask the Democratic Services Officer to read out the emergency evacuation procedure? If the continuous alarm sounds, you must evacuate the building and proceed to the named assembly point. From this room, you follow the green person signs using the main staircase and stone staircase at the end of the room. Please do not use lifts. Arrangements are in place for safe evacuation of disabled people. The assembly point for this building is the Orange Grove grass area opposite Bath Abbey. Thank you very much. And now if you could give details of any apologies for absence uh, and substitutions. Uh, we have one apology for absence from Councillor Paul Crossley, substituted by Councillor Rob Appleyard. Thank you. And declarations of interest. Do I have any in the room? No. There is no urgent business uh, agreed by the chair. Um, so now I'll turn to the Democratic Services Officer again to inform you of the public speaking procedure. So members of the public and parish councillors have registered to speak about individual plan applications on the agenda. Ward councillors not on the committee have also indicated they wish to speak about applications. Speakers will be called to speak immediately after the case officer has made their presentations about the application. The orders of speakers and the time allowed speaking will be as follows. Parish and town councillors representatives will speak first and be allowed three minutes in total. If there's more than one parish town council, they will require to share this time. Objectors on application will be allowed three minutes per application in total. Supporters on application will be allowed three minutes in total for each application. If, and if there's more than one objector or supporter on application, they must share the three minutes allowed for each side. Ward councillors not on the committee who have indicated they wish to speak about application may do so for a maximum of five minutes. The speeches will be timed by traffic light system, um, and you'll see on the table next to the chair, um, at the start of the will be green and return amber when there's one minute to speak in time remaining. When it turns red, she can just immediately conclude their remarks. Thank you. Uh, minutes of the previous meeting have been circulated. Do we have any comments on that or could I have somebody? Councillor Jackson. I'll propose a correct record, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Councillor Davis has seconded that, so I will sign those in a moment. So now we will start with the um, applications we've got in front of us today. And the first one uh, is on the site visit list. Um, I note that Councillor Hodge isn't here. Um, I don't know why. She's obviously been held up somewhere. Um, but once we've started the presentation, she will not be voting on this application. So when the officer is ready to present, happy for you to go ahead. Okay, I'm just being signaled that Councillor Hodge is here. So. Thank you. When you're ready, please, if the officer could start the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> okay, this proposal is for the development of an anaerobic digester facility along with the restoration of the former Queen Charlton Quarry site and associated works at a site off of Charlton Field Lane. So here we have the site location plan edged in red, along with recent aerial imagery of the site. The northern part of the site is where the AD plant is proposed, and the southern part is where the quarry restoration is proposed. The site is located within the green belt, and part of the site forms part of the wider Wuscombe SNCI complex. Here we have the existing site plan. There is built form on this northern part of the site, as you can see on the plans. This is because in 2014, an AD plant was permitted on the northern part of the site. This permission has now lapsed. However, works that have taken place are not in accordance with the plans and are therefore unauthorised. The southern part of the site shows the quarry in, 20, in 2010, the quarry's restoration using the importation of materials um, was, was permitted, recontouring the land in a singular mound with a high 
highest point of 124 metres AOD. However, the works, have taken place, the works that have taken place on the site are not in accordance with the approved plans and also unauthorised. As such, this is what should be taken as the baseline site plan and the starting point for assessment. The northern parcel is Greenfields and the quarry is the singular mound uh, restoration, landform restoration of 124 metres AOD. Next we have the proposed development. The northern part of the site will accommodate the AD plant facility and the various elements of built form which comprise that. Some of the uh, unauthorised built form is proposed to be retained. Um, so to run through the main elements, we have the access here, um, a digestate storage area, feedstock reception building, moving to the digester tanks, and the energy generation and the maze silage clamps. Um, oh, sorry, and the southern, the southern part of the site is reprofiled um, to 128 uh, metres AOD. Um, so for comparison, this plan shows the previous AD plant granted permission in 2014, which is outlined in pink, and that's imposed on top of the application plan. So you should just be able to make the outlines out there. Um, next, onto some site sections. This top section is taken across the length of the AD site, um, as marked on the plan here. And this bottom section is across the width, as shown by this red line here. Um, then we have the elevations of various elements of built form on the site. This side shows the buildings on the site that are proposed to be retained. And this slide shows the new elements of built form proposed. Then we have the sections for the quarry. So the top section is taken from north to south across the quarry. Um, and the bottom section is east to west. Uh, the green line, um, as you hopefully can just make out, shows the um, existing built out um, unauthorised landform. And the pink line just highlights the proposed landform. You can just sort of pick that up there. Then we have the landscaping plan for the proposed scheme. And finally, onto some site photos. So this top photo is taken within the site, looking back towards the access. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this second view is looking into the entrance of the site. Um, you can just see the quarry landform in the background. And this is moving through the site towards the AD plant. And then this is looking at um, some of the um, development that's, that's on the AD plant part of the site already. Um, again, the same here. We can see the tanks and the existing CHP units. Um, and then these are views I took walking through the uh, quarry landform. Um, they look very similar, but uh, this one's sort of further up. And then this is taken from Charlton Field, uh, sorry, Charlton Road, looking back towards the quarry uh, landform. And then this is um, two views taken from the, the top of the landform, um, looking down at the, the um, portion of the site where the AD plant will be um, and the sort of existing built form that's, that's on the site. So the proposal is recommended for refusal as outlined in the officer report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, right, we've got several speakers um, on this item. Uh, I should have Councillor Philippa Paget and Rob Duff at the front. So if I could invite Councillor Paget to speak whenever you're ready, if you can make sure you're near the microphone because the acoustics in this room are quite difficult. Thank you. Um, good morning. Yes, I, I'm um, Councillor on for, on um, Compton Dando Parish Council um, and this this is in our uh, parish um, so I'm speaking on behalf of the councillors 
to say we support many of the objection points made eloquently in a lot of the responses to this application. Um, this is a totally inappropriate location of a plant of this size. The scale of this application would lead to serious issues affecting our parishioners' lives, with the HGVs required for feeding the anaerobic digester and to take away the end products. Undoubtedly, there will be an increase, increase in use of our lanes and roads, giving congestion. Um, the country lanes and road network in the area locally and in the wider area are totally unsuited for this, for this type of traffic. Our parishioners are rightly concerned for their safety and quality of life um, when using the lanes um, by car, bike, walking or horse riding and their enjoyment for exercise, le leisure and relaxation affected by increased traffic, air pollution, dust, noise and the likelihood of increased accidents. Plus, they are rightly concerned about the ecological impact being unacceptable. The application under underestimates the number of vehicle journeys required, for example at harvest time when tractor and trailer transporting maize from farms. The sustainability and carbon reduction are questionable as the material fed into the digester is planned to include things such as fossil fuel grown crops and there's likely to be brought for, um, other materials from some considerable distance. We have conservation villages in our parish including Queen Charlton that's very nearby and the adjacent Woolard. In the past there was an area of high ecological value on the site where the old quarry has been and at the time we were sure this would be preserved. However, it was destroyed when it was buried under a huge mountain of soil and other materials deposited. The, the parish council remains concerned about the ecological area. Odours and aerosol particulates could affect the health of parishioners and have a detrimental impact on sensitive flora and fauna in the Chew Valley. There is insufficient justification to demonstrate any special circumstances to allow this inappropriate development in the green belt. The size of the anaerobic digester in this application is totally inappropriate for this rural location. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paget. And now, uh, Rob Duff, when you're ready, and if you could speak close to the microphone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, thank you, Chair Members. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak on behalf of POAC, who represent the local community who have made 847 objections to this application. Before you is an application for two major developments, a large AD facility capable of taking 92,000 tonnes of feed tax per annum and the retention and regrading of approximately 250,000 tonnes of unauthorised and unmonitored land raising to form a hill to screen the AD facility. Please do not confuse this application with the application made in 2014 and the lapse permission for only 24,000 tonnes that was fed almost entirely from green waste. This is a very different beast indeed. And just to clarify, the existing structures erected were not those approved in 2014. They are very different. The site is not previously developed or brownfield land, as the applicant would have you believe, but is a greenfield site within beautiful open countryside that has been damaged by unauthorised built development and unauthorised land raising. The site should have been restored years ago. The applicant should not be benefiting from causing such damage and deliberately creating an eyesore and then saying, we're going to make it better now. There's absolutely no need for the AD facility. The lack of need is confirmed by the evidence presented by POKE and by the council's own climate policy officer. I've been a town planner for over 30 years and I've never before I've come across an authorised development or proposed development as harmful to the green belt than the application before you today. The AD facility is both massive and ugly, but it's dwarfed by the large hill built for that planning permission. Very special circumstances have not been identified by the applicant nor the council for either development. The post development will and already is both visually harmful and spatially harmful to the openness of the green belt. Add to this the construction, the operating traffic, noise, lighting, odour, and the development will cause significant harm to the openness of the green belt, contrary to your own development plan and to the framework. The proposed AD facility is poorly designed 
and will be dependent upon grown maize and other feedstock taken out of the animal food chain, which is harmful to the environment. Feedstock will have to be shipped to the site for miles around, including most likely from the Somerset levels. The Council's own climate policy officer calls it eminently unsustainable, and I agree. The site is simply unsuitable for post development. If this need did exist, this is not the right site for it. I therefore respectfully ask you to support your officer's recommendation and refuse the planning application for the development proposed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you both. If you could um, come to the chairs behind me now, and if I could have Phil Gerard and Councillor Alistair Singleton to the front as the next two speakers. So, uh, Phil Gerard, when you're ready, um, please speak close to the microphone. Thank you. Good morning, Chair, uh, members of the Planning Committee. My name's Phil Gerard. I'm the Director of Resourceful Energy and Aerobic Limited, speaking as the applicant. This project takes waste, food and agricultural residues and turns them into clean, carbon-neutral renewable energy. It will significantly increase the district's renewable energy capacity and help to tackle the climate emergency declared by the Council three years ago. Also, in the light of the huge challenges we now face on energy security, it's a very timely opportunity. I hope you can support these proposals. Unfortunately, the report in front of you from the planning officer does contain some significant inaccuracies. I don't have time to correct them all, but I must address a few starting with the renewable energy. Members will be aware that the local plan set a target to develop 110 megawatts of renewable electricity and 165 megawatts of renewable heat capacity locally by 2029. Those targets are the bare minimum to meet important net zero targets. But since 2014, less than 22 megawatts of electricity and only 7.4 megawatts of heat has actually been delivered. Our project would deliver on both these targets 1.6 megawatts of electricity and 5.4 megawatts of gas. In total, that's seven megawatts, which is three times more than is inaccurately claimed in the report. The report also claims that this project would not contribute renewable heat. That is simply false. AD plants of this type qualify for government heat support, and this project alone would nearly double the district's renewable heat capacity. I'd also like members to think about why the report only gives moderate weight to the project's contribution to renewable energy targets, which seems a little complacent given the lack of progress made so far. I think it would be more appropriate to give significant weight to this contribution. When looking at the waste, the report also appears to conflate AD capacity with all other forms of non-residual waste processing. By doing so, the report masks the real need for additional AD capacity in the district. It also overlooks the significant regulatory changes in agriculture that mean that local farmers will need to process their waste more sustainably going forward. You cannot compare anaerobic digestion, which recovers energy and valuable biofertilizer from waste, to simply burning waste in an incinerator, but the report seems to treat them as interchangeable. Finally, the summary of ecological impacts is very misleading. On dormite, it's been demonstrated that this impact would be negligible, and on great crested newts, we did in fact conduct surveys which confirmed that there are no such newts on the site. Both of these points were acknowledged in the ecologist's report, but not in the officer's report. So I'm afraid the report in front of you does contain some serious inaccuracies. In conclusion, I believe members should consider how far off course the district is from its obligations on renewable energy and therefore give significant weight to the contribution this project makes to those renewable targets, but also to our overall energy security. Could you bring your comments to a close, please? Uh, that was my last sentence. I hope you'll take decisive action today to grant consent. Thank you. Thank you. 
And Councillor Singleton, when you're ready. Good morning. I'm Alistair Singleton, one of the ward councillors for Saltford Ward, in which the proposed development is cited. I also have a second role in the council as the member advocate for renewable energy, which means, in effect, that I seek to encourage and promote viable and effective renewable energy projects across the Baines area where they can be demonstrated to have a positive environmental impact and make a clear contribution to our green energy targets and net zero by 2030 ambition. At risk of letting slip a spoiler for what follows, the application before you this morning does not, by some margin, fall into that category. I have followed the fortunes of the Charlton Fields Lane site for many years and was a supporter of the much smaller 2014 scheme, which was genuinely designed to convert food waste into green energy, actively sought community involvement, and included an education centre and nature trails in its outline. How things have changed. The site remains one which is suitable for a renewable energy project, which could include a range of technologies such as solar or battery storage, but not a very large anaerobic digester like this. This application lacks coherence and integrity, and in my reading at least, is loaded in places with weasel words, and at times is even self-contradictory. You have seen many areas in question, including HGV movements and highways issues, odor and spore concerns, lighting, species protection and the like, and I will leave it to others with more expertise to address these. I intend to concentrate my attention on the environmental or green case which the applicant seeks to make. The officer report sees this as inappropriate development within the green belt and under the NPPF planning, planning permission should only be granted if very special circumstances can be demonstrated to exist. The applicant bases their case on the estimated 2.2 megawatt renewable energy generation contribution to Bain's targets which, they suggest, are currently being insufficiently addressed. That, by the way, is not true. In the planning balance element of this report, officers gave this moderate weight in their assessment. The critical element here is the feedstock which will be used in the anaerobic digester, digester to generate the green energy. Although the operation is presented as a food waste to energy scheme, and indeed was misleadingly described precisely as such, in the almost embarrassingly inept public engagement exercise at Compton Dando Parish Hall at the end of last year, in reality food waste forms only a small part of the mix, and where it will come from is not easy to ascertain. The Baines Food Waste Contract is committed to Genico in Avonmouth for many years to come, and suggestions that waste may be sourced and shipped in from neighbouring authorities, such as South Gloss or Wiltshire, seem both fanciful and fraught with downsides such as HGV mileage, road congestion, and diesel emissions. There is already adequate AD capacity for food waste in the region, and it is hard to comprehend the business case for building more. The feedstock baseload is presented as 24,000 tonnes of farmed maize silage. Maize is now widely accepted as an unsustainable feedstock, and producing that quantity could occupy somewhere in the region of 450 to 650 hectares of fertile agricultural land, which could otherwise be used to produce food. And in a country which cannot produce enough food to feed itself, that seems, frankly, bonkers. Maize is criticized as causing soil erosion and runoff problems, and by the time it is planted, cultivated, harvested and transported, perhaps from way outside the area, it is almost marinated in red diesel, which itself is a source of taxpayer subsidy to the fossil fuel industry. A third of the plant's operating emissions are expected to be methane, a significantly more damaging greenhouse gas than CO2, and the considerable emissions which would be generated by the construction of the scheme would take years to pay back in operation. The argument that many of them would occur outside Baines should be treated with the disdain which it deserves. Members of the committee, I could go on, but you've got the picture. This is not a green or environmentally sound project. It is a damaging commercial enterprise masquerading in diaphanous green clothing. It is opposed by all the local town and parish councils 
and I urge you to follow the eloquent and wise advice from officers and decide to reject the application. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. If you could come to seats behind me and could I have the final two speakers up, Councillor May and Councillor Hale. Councillor, may I understand that you'll be speaking twice, once for Councillor O'Brien, who isn't able to be here today, and then for yourself. Uh, perhaps if you could signal when you've finished Councillor O'Brien's statement so that we can reset the timer for yours. Um, and if you'd like to go ahead when you're ready, could, Councillor Hale, could you turn that microphone off, please? Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm the Baines representative for the parishes of Whitchurch and Pensford, uh, two parishes that immediately adjoin the site. Both parish councils have objected in the strongest way against this application and have supported me speaking this afternoon, actually this morning. Whilst I'm not a planning expert, I can and will comment on the implications for my communities. I think the officer's report and recommendations are exceptional and I support the a recommendation to reject. In simple terms, this is a strategically significant site that affects a very wide area, including Canesham, my parishes, the villages along the A37, and even Bristol and South Gloucestershire. Clearly, the Baines Local Plan Partial Update, which has been prepared in accordance with the MPPF, deals with strategy but does not have any proposal for this to be an exception to the green belt this plan was prepared after the application was submitted so it is relevant this site has already been harmed by a succession of owners without planning approval and this application is absolutely in the wrong place and cannot be justified in renewable energy terms, and if approved, no matter what conditions made, would be totally unenforceable after the, afterwards to the detriment of my communities. The RE case has not been proven and will do nothing for Baines communities except create traffic chaos, lighting pollution, dangerous spores, and smells. Indeed, my research shows that five AD sites nearby are currently operating at something like 70 to 75% of their capacity, and a new site is scheduled in Shepton Mallet uh, in the, in any day now for 100,000 tonnes. The demand case cannot be justified. The volume of traffic scheduled through my two villages maximises 196 HGV movements a, a, a day. Uh, and we, there's no indication of what the lorries will contain, what type of lorries they'll be, and how much uh, will reach the site. The A37 has major width restrictions in Pensford and frequent road blockages. Sat-navs then direct alternative routes through very narrow country lanes, which will be a disaster for pedestrians, cyclists, road users, and the small communities on those routes. At a time WECA are looking at strategic public transport routes and infrastructure, these volumes of potentially polluting vehicles will be in direct conflict with the climate and ecology emergency declared by this council, and create even more pollution, and the total process will not achieve zero climate measurements. The Baines LPPU protects the green belt in this area. The existing volumes of unauthorized fill and vast buildings are wrong and must not be used as an excuse for further development. If the committee reject the application, I recommend that further enforcement action is started immediately against all previous abuses. This is not a small application, and with nearly a thousand community objections, it clearly has strategic implications for this totally unsuitable Greenbelt site. Even the Wecken Mayor and the local MP have both spoken in public against this application and the location. 
I trust the committee will take the officer's professional advice in a strong and unanimous way. The community cannot afford to keep fighting the applicants uh, with their delaying tactics and their impact on innocent people's lives. Please back up this by taking immediate enforcement action on the existing uh, site. Thank you, Chair. So, was that Councillor O'Brien's statement or yours? That was mine, sorry. Right. So are you doing one for Councillor O'Brien? I've got Councillor O'Brien's statement here, Chair. So, shall so I... So, you're going to start that now. I'll wait for the finger on the button. Thank you yeah. very much. Councillors, in March 2019, I joined the rest of the Council in declaring a climate emergency, committing uh, a, against other things to finding energy alternatives. However, we must be careful we don't play into the hands of self-interested parties who seek to manipulate our impetus for their own financial gain. As Ward Councillor for South Canesham, I must speak out to protect my residents. Since the earlier application was made in 2013, 750 homes, as well as large extension to a primary school, have been built directly in the path of the southwesterly winds, which blow from this site for about 80% of the time. The inadequacy of odour control at the reception building, without the benefit of airlocks, and with the mystifying plan for vehicles to drive in, cab first, unload, then somehow do a three-point turn to drive out again, challenges the claim that there would be little escape of foul-smelling stench or rotting foodstuffs. Then there are the silage dumps, with the applicant uh, knowledges will be uncovered for some of the time. These will give off fungal spores and can emit odours. I want to especially highlight issues around the plan to process 24,000 tonnes of maize during the eight-week harvest season. Daily vehicle movements could increase from 90 to as much as 196 per day. It is estimated that 400 tonnes of maize could be sourced from farms within a five-kilometre radius. Almost certainly, farmers will use their own vehicles uh, and from the A4 Avon Valley area will drive right through the centre of Cainshan and up Charlton Road. My ward borders this road on one side and the opposite is also a heavily built up residential area. It is well known that maize gives off extensive uh, spores which has a particular adverse effect on the lungs of children and the elderly. Yet, if this application succeeds, our residents may have to endure eight weeks of this atmosphere polluted with dust and spores to the detriment of the health. Can this really be sanctioned? So how will the rest of the maize be sourced? It will have to be brought in by road from outside our local area, increasing carbon emissions and traffic congestion. Local farmers should be encouraged to grow more maize, shouldn't, sorry, shouldn't be encouraged to grow more maize to meet demand. The crop causes soil erosion, compaction and runoff which threaten the fertility of the land and the health of freshwater ecosystems. A large increase in maize production used to feed AD plant could therefore be doing serious damage to the land. As David Wurskett who's the chair of the CPRE Avon and Bristol says, significant amounts of crops will be grown to feed the plant when it is now vital that as much UK agricultural land as possible is used to produce food for human consumption. The plant would be essentially irrelevant to Bain's own climate change programmes and goals. It is purely commercial scheme which does not help the local targets at all and will indeed cause significant environmental damage of other kinds. The applicant's own figures demonstrate that even by 2030, only 15,000 tonnes of food waste will be generated in Baines. There are now five other local AD plants uh, functioning in our region at Avonmouth, Western Supermare, two near Wars Warminster and Cannington near Bridgewater, as well as the large plant under construction at Shepton Mallet. 
they reportedly are already short of feedstock, so where would supplies to run this new plant come from? They would have to come from a distance, adding to the climate emergency and very opposite to what we have pledged to do. Councillors, we have to tackle the climate emergency, but not at any price. The physical well-being of our residents and our local environment must come first. Please reject this application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor May. And last but not least, Councillor Hale, when you're ready. Thank you, Chair. I represent Kingsham South, as does Lisa, uh, where many hundreds of established and new homes will be affected directly by this inappropriate proposed development. Remember the figure, 28,000 additional HGV journeys per year on inappropriate roads. I'm addressing highway safety and my background and credential is 20 years as a road motor patrol police officer, laterally senior road safety officer of a neighbouring authority for 12 years and currently and for 20 years an examiner with the Institute of Advanced Motorists. The A37 is the feeder road from south and north and in both directions passes through a village, Pensford and Whitchurch, where each has its village school alongside the main road and thus significant potential for serious and fatal collisions with parents and children who have but a narrow pavement to use as their route to school. The heightened exposure to vehicle fumes will threaten their physical and mental health. In Pensford, there is a, already a problem for HGVs at a pinch point on Pensford Hill. HGVs cannot pass simultaneously. Residents already suffer without the proposed obscene increase of 28,000 HGV journeys per year. The applicant's proposal of a physical build-out on Pensford Hill to mitigate the impact through the village will cause more harm in terms of congestion, pollution and noise for residents. Interestingly, the applicants know they are delivering an impact. Upon entering Queen Charlton Road, HG HGVs are very quickly faced with a significant bend to the right into Willard Lane, where there is every danger of the HGV encroaching over the middle of the road and thus into the path of oncoming vehicles, which initially are not in line of sight. A significant potential for a collision head-on into one of the 28,000 additional HGV journeys. Willard Lane is then winding and, relatively speaking, narrow, and thus there is significant chance of two opposing HGVs colliding head-on or side-swiping each other due to the narrowness of the road. The road has several houses on it and with restricted view when exiting their drives directly onto the road. At the junction of Highwall Lane, Charlton Road and Willard Lane, HGVs bound for the site swing left. For HGVs leaving from the direction of the site, uh, and trying to emerge right into Charlton Road, uh, uh, from Charlton Road, sorry, into Willard Lane, there is very restrictive view to the left. Traffic emerging from Highwall Lane also has very restrictive views to the right. This triple junction is inappropriate for an additional 28,000 HGVs. On Charlton Road, the HGV drivers have to turn right into Charlton Fields Lane and they perform that manoeuvre on the crown of an almost blind left-hand bend within a 60 mile an hour speed limit. They have to ensure that there are no normal traffic users of the lane approaching the junction as the road is very narrow. Immediate, immediately upon entering the lane, the HGV has to reposition to turn left into the proposed inappropriate site. When leaving the site, the driver will have a restrictive view to the left and indeed to the right as the entrance exit is only a few metres from the main road junction and the need to join fast moving traffic. I would remind you that this problem is repeated 28,000 times a year if this inappropriate development is allowed. What chance of there never being a collision on the route anywhere during those 28,000 journeys? Despite whatever conditions might be imposed, there is every chance that some drivers, perhaps many, will abuse the Charlton Road weight restriction and drive through the town of Cainsham to reach or leave the site. It is suggested that trackers will be used to prevent this, 
Well, money talks and the risk will be taken. Criminals wear trackers and still commit crime. There is little in the way of road policing to prevent this happening. If they come through the town of Cainsham on Charlton Road, then the HGVs will pass along routes to school for three primary schools and one secondary. I should add that the figure of 28,000 plus equates to 112 HGV journeys per day. And during the maize har harvest, this would increase to around about 196 such journeys. Add to this the necessary journeys to remove the digestate liquor. I also have to mention the risk of windblown spores, as already has been mentioned, but I would want to reinforce it. The risk of windblown spores being carried into my ward and indeed Cainsham North to the detriment of the health of the residents. Councillor Hale, could I ask you to bring your comments sure. to close, please, because your time is up. Okay, add to that the odour that is likely also to be carried. I would earnestly ask you to, re to support the recommendation of the planning officer. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you could come back to the seats behind me. So, committee uh, questions to the officer who would like to speak. Councillor Jackson. Um, yes, I wondered if the officer could nail down a bit more precisely what we've heard from the speakers about the detrimental effect of growing maize. Uh, I'm very well aware of what the negative effects are in the two-thirds world, but we've got a different type of soil and ecology here. And I was wondering if there was any way of computing these negative um, effects, like the use of chemicals, for example, um, against what are alleged to be the benefits of growing feed for the biodigester. I'm afraid I don't have that information. Okay, anybody else got any questions? No? Okay, well, I'll open the debate then, and I'll turn to Councillor Hounsell, who's the ward member for Salford. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, I'm Councillor Duncan Hounsell. I'm one of the ward councillors for Salford Ward, uh, in which this location lies. Uh, this is an application of considerable interest and concern to many residents, local parish councils, Cainsham Town Council and others across a wide area. There are almost 850 individual objections lodged and a small number in support. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, everyone that's taken part so far in the planning process. As we know, a planning application is not a referendum and must be considered and determined on planning grounds alone. Although there is a plethora of documents associated with this application, the issues in planning terms are straightforward. The MPPF, National Planning Policy Framework, is clear in paragraph 147. Inappropriate development is by definition harmful in the Green Belt and should not be approved except in very special circumstances. Power 151. When located in the Green Belt, elements of many renewable energy projects will comprise inappropriate development. In such cases, developers will need to demonstrate very special circumstances. Such very special circumstances may include the wider environmental benefits associated with increased production of energy from renewable sources. Keep that phrase in your mind, very special circumstances. The applicant's agent, Boyer, in its planning statement, January 2021, confuses this test, very special circumstances, with, with the much weaker concept of opportunities. In fact, we heard that word again from the uh, speaker this morning. In the executive summary, Boyer states, and I'm quoting from uh, the applicant's agent, the above notwithstanding, following a detailed assessment of the various planning and environmental considerations, we consider that on balance, the limited harm to the green belt and other harm represented by this proposal are considered to be outweighed by the opportunities it provides. It then goes on to list the supposed opportunities. In the more recent planning policy response note, Boyer continues in the same vein. Boyer states, we are concerned that the council has not taken into account the significant benefits of the scheme in their policy assessment. A policies and benefits which are disputed are not in themselves, in my view, very special circumstances. 
Very special circumstances requires a compelling argument to be made. The applicant has, in my opinion, failed to give a compelling case. What are the special circumstances that mean this type of plant must be built in this specific location of this nature and size and now? The applicant makes reference to Baines Council's policy declaration of a climate emergency and the desire to make Baines carbon neutral by 2030. The local plan we have was produced in 2014. The local plan partial update has yet to be tested in hearings by the independent inspector this year. The next full local plan does not exist. The council's declaration of a climate emergency has no weight or very limited weight in planning terms at this point in time. The applicant makes much of the existing policy CP3, which seeks to achieve an increase in the level of renewable energy in the district and targets again for 2029. This is seven years away and it's for the council, not a developer, to manage how these targets are met in line with policy. The main policy in the Joint Waste Core Strategy that relates to the development of AD facilities is Policy 2. Policy 2 states that planning permissions for non-residual waste treatment facilities involving recycling, storage, transfer, materials recovery and processing will be granted subject to development management policies. One, on land that is allocated in a local plan or development plan document for industrial or storage purposes or has planning permission for such use, or two, on previously developed land, or three, at existing or proposed waste management sites, subject in the case of landfill and land raising sites or other temporary facilities to the waste use being limited to the life of the landfill, land raising or other temporary facility. The proposed site is not on land that is allocated or has planning permission for industrial or storage purposes. It's not on previous developed land. Uh, it's not at existing or proposed waste management sites. Therefore, the application is considered contrary to JWCS policy two. The previous planning permission uh, or planning permissions on this site 2013-14 was for a much smaller scale operation processing food waste. The subsequent works on site did not match what was authorised. The visitor reception with exhibition and teaching space never materialised, for example. Those permissions have lapsed. There have been planning policy changes since, both at local and national level. Understanding of the issues has developed as well. There are people who supported the 2013-14 scheme but object to this one. That permission in 2013 has little or no weight in our decision today, in my view. It's like the dead parrot in the famous Monty Python sketch. It has ceased to be. Uh, an agent for the applicant, Royal Haskin in DHV, in its objection response dated the 21st of January this year, states that emissions during construction are estimated at 81,868 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent, of which 97% would be embodied emissions within materials used to build the new infrastructure. The net saving in greenhouse gas emissions is said by the applicant to come after six and a half years. The applicant states that a search was made of suitable industrial sites within Baines, Bristol and South Gloucestershire. It's claimed that none of them would be an acceptable alternative to the application site. Why not look at North Somerset or wider afield? There are existing AD sites in industrial areas in Western Supermare and Avermouth. Are these plants at capacity? Are plants in the wider region at capacity? Baines Council is one of the leading authorities in the country for waste management and recycling. There have been large increases in the food waste collected in this area. Overall, only 3% of all waste went to landfill in 2020-21. Bain's food waste is processed currently at a plant in Avermouth and turned into biofertilizer for agriculture and renewable energy. There is no need for another plant to process food waste. There are profound highways issues to consider, both in the construction phase and the operational phase of the new proposal. The committee may wish to consider the impact of the proposal for the local road network, which is essentially rural in character, and the impact on the wider highway network resulting from lorry movements further afield. 
Charlton Field Lane, the junction with Charlton Road, the junction of Charlton Road with Woodard Lane and the exit points of Ringspit Lane and Highwall Lane, so very close to that junction. Woodard Lane itself are all unsuitable for this increase in HGV and other vehicle movements. I have an email headed, Accident Black Spot on Charlton Road, dated the 1st of January 2021 from Church Farm Equestrian Centre. It states that since 2012, there have been at least 11 accidents uh, with, uh, on occasion cars leaving the road between Redditch Lane and this location. Although not on the so-called haul route for this development, this list of accidents highlights the characteristics of Charlton Road. Too fast, too narrow, uh, too windy. Uh, Royal H, I'll just use an abbreviation, states in the non-technical summary in addition, issues with runoff from the existing development and quarry area would continue if nothing is done, presenting flooding hazards and associated road safety issues on Charlton Road during or subsequent to periods of heavy rainfall. That's an astonishing admission. I'm sure the insurance companies involved with accident claims on that stretch of road will be very interested to read that, especially those claims associated with the freezing road surface. The A37 also presents significant challenges such as identified by Pueblo and Pensford Parish Council and Whitchurch Parish Council. And what a further afield. In the Royal H Construction Management Plan, it helpfully points out in Construction Traffic Routing 4.2.6, quote, all suppliers will be advised to plan their route for the specified size of vehicle and identify where to stop safely. The closest lie part to the site, which has the capacity for heavy goods vehicles with food, drink, and sanitary facilities is, I just pause a second for a, a dramatic effect, Gordano Services. Moreover, uh, it remains unclear the route to this site of any lorry starting a journey to the site from the east of Canesham. And just referring back to that reference to Gordano Services, that, that uh, in itself implies that there is an expectation that lorries will be coming from considerably further afield than the local area. Construction is expect estimated to take 18 months. There is a fundamental problem with the proposed construction traffic management plan as regard highways. C3.5.4, the section of the pipeline along Charlton Road would be constructed in sections of single lane alternate working, enabling traffic co to continue to use the route. The route of the pipeline along the lane connecting Charlton Road and the watercourse, and I refer to construction management plan map insert to site location and drainage plan, would not prevent access to any properties in Queen Charlton as an alternative route to the village would be maintained at all times. There is a live livable neighborhood scheme at the design stage to prevent rat running through Queen Charlton. The junction onto Charlton Road will be the only way in and out of Queen Charlton. There will be no alternative route. In the non-technical study by Royal H, it states in section 4.9, human health, during construction there's potential for the following effects to impact human health. Noise effects, air quality, ground uh, and or water contamination, physical activity effects, journey time and or reduced access effects. The assessment concluded that during the construction all effects would be short term, temporary and would cease on completion of the works, that's 18 months. During operation, Royal H wrote, there is the potential for the following effects to impact human health. Noise effects, air quality effects, ground and or water contamination, journey time and or reduced access and, uh, and aspergillus spores. It goes on to write, the significance of the air quality effects and journey times and or reduced access would be negligible for the general population and minor adverse for vulnerable groups. The same statement is made for spores. Often the committee is reminded that an objection on a particular policy grounds has to be backed up by evidence. However, in this case, no further evidence is needed to be provided by the committee because the applicant concedes the minor adverse effects for vulnerable groups. 
This, in my view, represents loss of amenity to such residents who live nearby, such residents living in Queen Charlotte and in Canesham South Ward, against policy D6, PCS1, and PCS3. And I note policy PCS1 specifically embodies the precautionary principle. There may be 80 plants elsewhere in the country in residential areas, but the planning balance and planning policies may have been different in those locations. This harm, however minor, adds to the list of harms with this application. I am concerned about what is referred to as Unit B or the Southern Parcel. Uh, the baseland land height is 124 meters at the highest peak. This was the height that was required in a previous remediation. Development has taken place in which unknown landfill has been used to raise the height to 130 meters which is substantially higher and associated with additional massing and contouring. This current application seeks to reduce the height to 128 meters. That is still four meters above the baseline height. The developer should not gain any advantage from previous unauthorized works. Clearly, an increase in height of four meters affects the openness of the green belt in this location. I will not take time by referring to all aspects of the case officer report, which I thought was excellent. I propose a motion to support the officer's recommendation to refuse this application for all the reasons stated in her report, especially the fundamental green belt, highways, and waste policy objections. The applicant has made a less than compelling case that very special circumstances apply that will outweigh all the accumulated harm identified in the report. I would like to add as further reasons for refusal, the harm to vulnerable groups which I have described, and to add to the reasons for objecting on highways grounds, the apparent incompatibility of the construction management plan with the current livable neighborhood scheme in Queen Charlton Lane. I also want to add as a reason for refusal the loss of openness of Greenbelt in the Southern Quarry section. I move refusal on all those grounds. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hounsell. Do I, do I have a seconder for that motion? Councillor Clark? Thank you. So we will continue with the debate and I had Councillor Davis next. Thank you. Um, this is a site I know well because until the last elections it was in my ward and um, there have been numerous enforcement issues to do with the height of work that's been going on there over many, many years. I used to deal with Councillor Edwards before Councillor May because it's so close to the borders of different parishes there. Um, and I do think that the, we've, we've always had objections to everything but never this number that you see now in front of you. And the um, approval in 2013-14 went through, but I can't say it went through with everybody's full support. There were certainly a few um, objections at that stage as well then, but never the number you've seen here today. The roads in that area you saw on the site visit are just not suitable. I, I think it's been clearly explained by just about everybody um, who's spoken. It's just not the right place to have this type of facility, and therefore I strongly um, support the officer's recommendation that we've got before us. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Councillor Appleyard. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, like Sally, I would support the officer's recommendation on this. I think uh, we seem to be pushing an open door on, on here. Uh, but I would like to actually just um, compliment the officer on the very full report that's uh, been placed in front of us has given us a very clear indication of the challenges on there. I think although I support the objective of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the facility. There are so many things wrong with actually achieving it, and on, on that basis, that's why I would support the officer's recommendation to refuse. Thank you, Councillor Appleyard. Councillor Jackson. Thank you, um, and thanks to the officer for such a comprehensive report, although I think the ward councillor, Councillor Hansel, somewhat uh, upstaged her with a very um, exhaustive argument why we should vote against this, which we most certainly should, because the bottom line is it's a quite intolerable excrescence in the green belt. It's far too high. It's going to mean such a loss of amenity for the residents. But much more to the point, as the councillor Hansel has pointed out, there is no quantifiable benefit 
for our local residents. It's not a necessary plant. We sympathise with the people at Avonmouth who have to put up with terrible smells and disruption and heavy vehicles and so on. Um, but we don't want our, a share of it here in Baines, I'm afraid. It may be nimbyism, but this is beautiful green belt and it should be kept for the residents to enjoy. So um, I was going to second the motion. Uh, I'll certainly third it or fourth it or whether the appropriate thing is. And, and, and I would think probably we're all in agreement and could have a vote. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Would anybody else like to contribute to the debate before we go to a vote? Councillor Hodge. I, th um, I support everything that's been said before. I just want to be clear on the three uh, additional reasons that uh, Council Hounsell proposed and what the, the view is on those. Um, the, the, um, in terms of planning reasons, the, the effect of vulnerable groups, the loss of openness in the green belt, and I can't remember the third one actually, but um, those were added to the motion. Uh, they were additions to what the officer had recommended. I want to be clear on those. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can I just ask the senior planning officer whether he's got all of those? Thank you, Chair. I, I was going to ask, just to, just to come back on those three uh, suggested or, or, mo or uh, moved additional reasons for refusal. Um, I think in terms of openness, impact on the openness of the green belt in terms of the quarry, I mean, obviously, from an officer's point of view, we're, we're satisfied with that. But, but, of course, the committee, if it's so minded, can, can add that as a, as a reason for refusal. And I, and I think that's something that we could... Um, it's something we could try and defend. Um, my, my concern is the suggestion that related to harm to vulnerable groups. I, I assume Councillor Hansel was re referring to health and, and, and the impact of emissions and so on. Could, could, could I just could yeah. that be clarified, Chair? Councillor Hansel? Yeah, just to clarify, it was in the applicant's report that there would be minor adverse harm, those words were used, and I see that as a, an example of, of harm that it, it may be minor, but it adds to the accumulation of harms, and I think it should be referred to. Thank you, Chair. Um, it, it, it's certainly the case that the impact on health is a planning material consideration. Um, the only thing I would um, to sort of warn committee of, really, is obviously planning is, is an evidence-based discipline, really, and, and we, would, we would have to, if that, if that went on as a reason for refusal, we would have to be able to demonstrate at appeal and provide evidence that there would actually be an unacceptable impact on, on, on health. And I am just minded, I'm just reminded of paragraph 188 of the MPPF, um, which says that the focus of planning policies and decisions should be on whether proposed development is, in, is an acceptable use of land, rather than the control of processes or emissions, where these are, the subject, where these are subject to separate pollution control regimes. And it, and it says that planning decisions should assume these regimes will operate effectively. So whilst it, they recognise there will be some adverse impact um, in terms of health, it, it's not clear to me that that is actually constituting something that's contrary to policy in planning terms. And, and it's not clear to me where the evidence is. But as I said uh, at the start, Chair, of course, it, it is in the, the gift of committee to add that as a reason for refusal. I, I just, my view is that we would not be able to defend that uh, appeal. And the, the highways reason, I mean, obviously um, an additional or an addition to the highways reason has been suggested. I don't know if the, uh, there's a highways officer here, Chair. I don't know if the highways officer wants to add something to that. Okay, I'll ask that. I think Councillor Hounsell wanted to speak on the uh, amenity. Uh, 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 just the, the, that point about uh, the minor adverse harm. Uh, the, the evidence has come from the applicant's report and we do have specific policies that I, I refer to. Um, this, this would seem to contravene, uh, particularly PS, PCS1 and PCS3. So my objection is based on those policy grounds. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hounsell. Um, uh, Highways officer, have you got any comment on the other um, uh, additional reason for refusal? Yeah, so I understood that the additional reason for refusal was um, lack of compatibility with the livable neighbourhoods scheme uh, in Queen Charlton. Um, I am aware as of, I think, week before last that um, there was a scheme announced to be taken forward um, for design, but um, from what I've been able to find out, I haven't been able to see adequate detail to confirm that um, 
the construction couldn't be managed alongside um, the proposed scheme. So um, there's certainly potential for conflict, um, but I haven't seen a sufficient level of detail to be able to confirm that it couldn't, it couldn't be managed alongside. Um. Okay, thank you. I mean, I would also say that we've got no guarantee that it will be approved. No, Chair, can I just say I'd be happy with those words, a potential for conflict. Does that work, Senior Planning Officer? Yes, that's fine, Chair. Uh, Councillor Bromley, did you want to add anything? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I'd like to support the officer's recommendation. Um, figures given state that the emissions produced during the construction phase would take 24 years to be offset by the renewable energy produced, and that's well beyond the 2030, 2030 the year Baines has pledged to be carbon neutral. Okay, thank you. Councillor Jackson? Uh, well, Chair, if we rewind a bit to what the senior planning officer said, it seems to me that his question is answered on page 47 of the officer's report, which spells out policy ST7. And I'm afraid I cannot see that the application is compliant with policy ST7, which is about highways safety. Uh, and I'm, I'm quite sure it would, I, I would get knocked over if I walked up that road after this development had taken place. It's, um, it says here, um, there should be safe and convenient access to and within the site for pedestrians, cyclists, and those with a mobility impairment. Um, and there isn't going to be as far as I can see. Okay. No further comment from the highways officer on that one? Uh, yeah, just to clarify, we are raising objections on highway safety and access. Um, my comments were just regarding um, Councillor Hounsell's additional reason for refusal regarding the construction management plan. But we do have three reasons uh, or objections to the application from highways. Okay, thank you very much. So, turning to senior planning officer again, looks like we're sticking with those three. Are you comfortable that we've got those recorded? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you, Chair. Okay, anybody else want to contribute to the debate before we go to the vote? No? So, um, motion we have on the table is to support the officer's recommendation with the additional three um, planning reasons for refusal proposed by Councillor Hounsell and seconded by Councillor Clark. All those in favour? That is unanimous, Chair. The motion's carried. Thank you. Um, so we've been going for an hour and the next one's going to be a long one. So do you want to take a quick break and stretch your legs, committee members? Please come back as quickly as you can. Thank you.
most to ask in the corner. Are we all up and running in live? Yes, thank you, Councillor Jackson. Chair, I do appreciate we still have a COVID problem, but I'm suffering very much from the fact the AC has turned up very high, um, so there's a terrific cold draft coming in, and now the windows are being opened. Surely in the interests of climate emergency, we should switch off the AC if that's, we're going to have the windows open. As, sorry, is the AC on? I, I, I actually asked for the windows to be open because of COVID. Um, perhaps, uh, no, there's no air conditioning in this room. Uh, we could maybe ask for the one down at the bottom to be shut again if you're in, in a draft from that. And, sorry, Councillor Hounsler? For Councillor uh, Jackson, let's close the window opposite her. If somebody can uh, do that. Okay. Sorry. Can you leave the ones at the top here open? As the figures for COVID are going up again in Baines quite significantly, I would rather be safe, but I appreciate your cold. Thank you, facilities. And the other one, perhaps, just at that end. Thank you. Right. Um, before we go on to the next one, which is Bath Rugby Club, um, I just want to explain what we're going to do here. We have three applications um, which are variations on a theme if you like so what I propose to do is uh, to have the officer present to cover all three we'll have the speakers to speak to cover all three we'll then have questions to the officer to cover all three after that we will move on to a debate and I anticipate probably the debate will cross across all three, but um, we'll take a motion on the first one and decision on the first one. And after that, I will put offer back out to debate for the next one, just in case anyone wants to add anything before we go to a vote on the second and the third. Is everybody clear? Okay with that? So this means that the speakers have got three lots of time, if you like. So effectively, the um, public speakers have got uh, um, nine minutes. All right. Okay. So if I could uh, ask the officer to do the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so yes, as, as you pointed out, it's items one, two, and three on the agenda. Um, and uh, I will go through the descriptions in detail of each item in a moment. Um, but essentially, uh, in, in a nutshell, they are seeking the renewal of various temporary consents. Um, for the Bath Rugby Club, which is on the Bath Recreation Ground um, in Bath, in the centre of Bath. Uh, so just starting with uh, an aerial uh, photo to locate ourselves, obviously we're right in the centre of Bath here, uh, the Bath Recreation Ground in this area here. We've got the Rugby Club with their uh, existing stands. Um, you've got the Parade Gardens, you've got the River, the, the Weir, Pulteney Bridge. So we're obviously in the heart of the World Heritage Site, uh, heart of the Bath Conservation Area, uh, we're within the setting of numerous listed buildings and registered park gardens, and it's obviously a highly sensitive location. Um, so just on the description of item one, um, I've put the description on uh, the uh, slide here. It's quite wordy because it is a variation of a uh, a variation of a variation of a temporary consent. So um, I've tried to highlight the uh, key elements here, which is um, essentially what this is seeking, which is uh, renewal of temporary consent for the erection of temporary sex spectator stand along the eastern side of the playing field. So you can see it's this stand uh, in this location here, um, including associated works, ancillary facilities comprising flood lighting, toilets, food and bar facilities within the structure. 
Um, there are, um, so it's just been pointed out to me before the meeting, the description is a little bit um, confusing if, 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 if it's not understood correctly. Um, so it's a variation of condition one of the previous temporary consent. And then in brackets here, it has the description of that previous temporary consent. And the previous temporary consent was for a two year period. And so that's why it refers to uh, remain, the, the development remaining, remaining in situ for a further two year period. This application is actually requesting um, a further four year period. So I don't want anyone to get confused and think they're asking for, four, uh, for two years here. They're actually asking for four years and I'll explain that in a bit more detail in a minute. But moving on, just on to some plans. Uh, the, there aren't very many plans. It is the, ex the existing East Stand as it, as it stands today. Um, this is just the plan that was submitted with the original temporary consent application showing the, the stand and its sort of construction on the, on the east side of the, of the uh, rugby club. Item two um, is for the uh, west stand and seating including camera gantry, uncovered seating, associated works and ancillary facilities uh, including retention of existing flood lighting, erection of boundary fence with new access gates onto the riverside path, provision of toilets, and food and bar facilities within the temporary stand. Again, that is all existing stuff, um, it, that is how the site currently is, and it's uh, uh, application seeking renewal of those temporary consents for a further four years. Um, it should be important to note on this that the, um, the west stand um, is uh, only parts of the west stand are temporary. There are a couple of parts which are actually per have permanent permission. That is the retaining wall, which is the one that fronts onto the, the river edge, and the slab on which the stand sits, so just, just for, for clarity. Um, and so just showing you that, uh, some images of, of the west stand. So the west stand has the sort of the cover on the top. Um, you've got this is the elevation onto the river. So you've got that, that wall is, is, is a permanent, uh, has got permanent consent along with the slab. And then you've got the temporary bits um, around there. Oop, skipped on. Uh, and then item three, um, Item three overlaps a little bit with item one, and I'll just explain what that means in a moment. But essentially, it's for um, the erection of uh, temporary spectator stands along the north and eastern sides of the playing field, erection of hus hospitality boxes to either side of the retained south stand, erection of control box and screen scoreboard between north and east stands, including fence enclosure, associated works and ancillary facilities comprising flood lighting, toilets, food and bar facilities within the temporary north and east stands. Now, um, You'll see the reference there to the east stand, and if, if you remember from item one, that, that one also covers the east stand. There are actually two consents in place um, for the east stand. Uh, item one is, uh, well, item three, the temporary consent that uh, this originally relates to, the east stand was in a slightly different position. Item one um, relates to a temporary consent that subsequently came along and moved the east stand three meters uh, essentially to the east. So the position as it stands is that um, the stand relates to item one essentially. Um, this would renew the consent to allow it to, if it wanted to, to move back those three meters, but there's no intention to implement that part of the permission. So this essentially relates to um, the relevant parts of the north stand and those other features, including the, uh, the hospitality boxes either side of the south uh, retained south stand. So between the three items, you've got north, south, east, west uh, stands, essentially uh, the various temporary elements of those stands, which are, as I said, how they exist on the site today. Um, there are no proposals to change the design or the appearance of any of those. These applications do not include any new plans um, or any new development that's not already on the site. Uh, and just to show you, the sorry, uh, on item three, a plan showing the north stand and a plan showing the south stand. <clears throat> um, so just a, an overview uh, photograph to show you the, 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 the rugby club um, from the, uh, this is sort of from the northwest sort of angle. Um, so as I s said before, um, this is, these are three applications uh, which are seeking renewal of existing temporary consents for the various um, stands around the rugby club. Um, they were, the temporary consents for these stands were originally granted in 2016 and 2017 um, with permission uh, 
to be for temporary consent until May 2020. Um, in May uh, 2020, obviously, we were at the beginning of the uh, coronavirus pandemic and a subsequent application to renew these temporary consents was, was received and was granted for a further two years, um, based largely on the fact that it, during May 2020, we were in heavy lockdown and there was a large degree of uncertainty about what was going to happen uh, in the next two years. And uh, that uh, formed the basis of allowing the flexibility of, of an additional um, two years uh, temporary consent. Um, so fast forward to uh, now, we're obviously the, these temporary consents expire in May of this year. Uh, and uh, it's, I think this is a useful point to, to, to talk about what the purpose of granting temporary permission uh, was as part of those temporary consents, which was the temporary consents were essentially to allow the rugby club to operate as a meanwhile use as the, their permanent stadium uh, development, redevelopment proposals were advanced. Um, so over the past two years, um, the, the rugby club had largely uh, paused their uh, redevelopment uh, proposals in light of the uncertainty um, created by the coronavirus pandemic. However, they have recently uh, re-engaged with the council in seeking and seeking uh, to engage in further pre-application discussions about the permanent uh, redevelopment proposals. Um, there have been uh, scoping opinions issued in 2019 and for earlier pre-apps, so there has been quite a bit of progress made. Um, uh, and, and so now, uh, in seeking to ensure that they have sufficient time to bring forward those proposals, they're requesting a further four-year extension uh, to their temporary consents. Um, officers consider this to be a reasonable time frame, um, given that there isn't currently a planning permission in place for the redevelopment of the, um, of the uh, stadium. Uh, we would anticipate, say, uh, an estimated 12 months to get a planning permission in place with uh, an additional three years uh, to allow the commencement of that, uh, of any planning permission. So in officer's view, the, the request for four years is, is reasonable. Um, and uh, for that reason, um, officers are recommending um, all three of the applications um, for approval um, subject to conditions. Um, and it's also worth saying that the conditions, uh, with the exception of the extension to the target uh, the, of the temporary period, for the permissions, um, the conditions would remain identical to those on the existing uh, temporary consents. Uh, happy to take any questions after the speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so we have four speakers, um, public speakers to start with, who I understand are going to share nine minutes. Um, and the first speaker is Keris Humphreys. Can I ask um, when you've finished your bit can you sort of make it clear and the officer will pause so you don't lose any time in between speakers especially when you two have finished and we need to swap in the the third and fourth speakers so when you're ready thank you uh, just to quote the senior planning officer before the break planning is an evidence-based process so where's the up-to-date travel plan Match days draw huge amounts of traffic into Bath, especially Bathwick. There have been huge national policy changes in the last three years on sustainable and active travel, and huge local changes in where people drive and park due to city centre security zone and the CAS. Since the temporary consents in 2016, the MPPF provisions on sustainable transport have changed radically to reflect climate change and new net zero obligations. Where's the evaluation of an up-to-date travel plan against the relevant changes in NPPF 104 to 113 and against new physical local traffic arrangements? It's not just the changes, but the unprecedented pace of change happening since 2019 and urgently ongoing in light of new national and local targets on net zero. The committee report says the council's climate emergency declaration is relevant. But a four-year extension of temporary arrangements will blight a central and busy part of Bath with unsustainable transport impacts for, for much too long at a time when sustainability needs to be expedited to achieve urgent carbon reduction targets. And how can a decision be taken without considering compliance with paragraph 97 NPPF, which requires your decision to promote public safety and take account of wider security requirements and police advice? 
The recently published advice from Avons and Somerset Police, cited in my objection, explicitly raises the wreck and Bath Rugby, but directly contradicts the last public travel plan. And it proposes security measures covering streets around the wreck, including Pulteney Bridge, where pedestrians are far more vulnerable to hostile vehicle attack than they ever were in nearby areas now closed on police adv advice. The planning process is about applying the rules without fear or favour, so before a decision you need an up-to-date travel plan complying with MPPF on these matters, and any extension should be limited to two years, otherwise consent should be refused. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, when you're ready. I live next door to Bath Rugby's least area of the wreck. My solicitor's local authority search flagged up the terms of the 1956 conveyance guaranteeing the wreck could never be commercially developed or cause nuisance to my adjoining property. Please read and enforce the terms of the 56 endorsed in 2002 as charity land. Citizens will hold you to account. 20 years of prevarication and renewals of temporary applications for this shanty town, and now they want four more years. Stop being deceived by the ruse use of the word temporary, which avoids scrutiny of heritage and conservation bodies. Let the last UNESCO status of Liverpool's, lost status of Liverpool's waterfront and Derby be your wake-up call. Please stop renewals. Bogus excuses have kept the large, enlarged East Stand permanently in place since August 2019. The gravel road behind it has no permission. Residents count the days until early May when the blocking high green wall of the East Stand is removed for the summer. Please remove the gravel road, remove the East Stand this May, reduce the stand size. The wreck is a designated floodplain. Bath has been lucky so far. Stop allowing interference of the floodplain. Please protect our homes. The massive TV screen used 16 times a year dominates for 365. Johnston Street is fragile. Please reduce the ghetto, which is the north stand at night. Remove the giant screen. A councillor once openly said, what Bath Rugby wants, Bath Rugby will get through planning. Please don't be the planners or councillors who continue to deliver this mantra. Refuse these applications. Restore our rec for Bath citizens. Restore our lost faith in the planning process. Thank you. Thank you. If we could have the next two speakers up to the front, please. And I think uh, it's Martin Farrell to go That's next, right. when you're ready. Yeah, thank you, Chair. We are here today because of policy SB2 and the placemaking plan for Stadium on the Wreck. SB2 was formed, ignoring, ignoring the fact that it cannot legally be implemented. The problem is, firstly, the symbiotic relationship between the planners and Bath Rugby, approving everything Bath Rugby wants, and secondly, because successive administrations have been too reluctant, through timidity or lack of knowledge, to tell Bath Rugby enough is enough. Previous applications to continue the use of temporary stands have solicited a statutory response from the Council's conservation team. Why is there no conservation response on this occasion? On previous occasions, the Conservation Officer stated that the continuance of temporary stamps have a negative impact on the historic environment. I wonder if you agree. In recent officer's report, the officer claimed that the West Stand has little presence in the local built environment. This unrealistic claim serves to show that the planner's judgment is frankly misguided. No wonder that the planners with such a lax ethos have consistently approved everything Bath Rugby wants. I wonder how many of you agree that the West End has little presence slap bang in the middle of the World Heritage Site. The planners are supposed to protect Bath, not spoil it. They also consistently claim that all developments on the wreck are less than substantial. This lowers the bar in level of scrutiny, making it easier to approve applications. I wonder if you agree with this approach. You should know by now that the NPPF states that it is rare for temporary consents to be extended over under, only under special circumstances. So I ask you whether the 20-year history of temporary stands and the prevarication by Bath Rugby over a possible stadium is a special circumstance or not. In addition, a meanwhile use as claimed in the application as a legitimate excuse is an incorrect description as the use is continuous, not meanwhile. 
The planners consistently would ignore all objections made on previous occasions, so I would hope that members have now read all the objections, read the 1956 conveyance, and come to understand that because of it, Target and MacDonald will need to bring an action against the Council to progress with any stadium for 18,000 fans on 16 days each year. Hardly a sustainable development when it's empty for the other 349 days. The Lambridge training ground, which unlike the wreck is owned by the club, is the obvious solution to the problem of Bath Rugby, temporary or permanent. For goodness sake, can someone with some courage and common sense in the council start to turn the tide and tell Bath Rugby where to go? Other sporting clubs relocate, so why can't Bath Rugby? Thank you, and I think lastly, Steve Osgood. Could you turn your microphone on, please? Thank you. Good morning, Chairman. I'm speaking for the 200 members of the Association of the Friends of the Recreation Ground to highlight an obstacle which undermines the credibility of both the applicant and the local planning authority. The applicant is unable to produce the necessary Certificate of Lawful Use under Section 12 Town and Country Planning Act 1990 because his land registry title is subject to the conditions of the 1956 Convention. I have these documents here for your perusal. The 2014 core plan policy B2B for developing the REC is written as being conditional on the resolution of unique legal issues. In 2002, the Council applied to the High Court for clarification of the 1956 conditions that the REC should remain as open space for amateur activities only. The Court upheld these conditions and confirmed the Council as custodian in perpetuity. Your planning officer puts this Council in contempt of that 2002 judgment, which I also have here. The 2020 High Court judgment, quite recent, confirmed that charity beneficiaries in this case, the Mayor, Alderman and citizens of Bath, hold power of enforcement. The Councillor's legal custodian is under obligation to enforce those conditions. I call upon each one of you to support the rule of law and refuse these applications. Thank you very much. If you'd uh, like to take your seat behind me, and can I now invite the next two speakers, uh, Tim Burden and Tarquin MacDonald. I understand Tim Burden is going to be speaking. Morning. Okay, Tim Burden, when you're ready. Thank you. Chair, members, thank you for the opportunity to address you today. I'm Tim Burden from Turley, the planning consultant for Bath Rugby. I'm also joined by Tarquin MacDonald, Chief Executive of Bath Rugby, who, although will not be speaking today, is happy to answer any questions you may have. I'd firstly like to thank your officers for bringing these three applications to committee, all with a recommendation for approval following their robust consideration through the application process. I'll cover a number of matters within my allotted nine minutes. Firstly, I'll introduce today's applications, then explain the various and now resolved non-planning legal matters relating to the REC, then provide an update on Stadium for Bath and the 1922 conveyance. Finally, I'll then turn back to planning matters, which are for your consideration today. The club's current planning permissions for temporary facilities expire at the end of this coming season. These applications seek their extension for a further four years, and as I will explain, these are to allow the Stadium for Bath proposals to progress and for the non-planning legal considerations to be resolved once and for all. For clarity, I'd like to highlight that no changes are proposed to the existing site set up through these applications. There are no changes proposed to the planning conditions. This committee is being asked to approve exactly what is in situ today and what this council has approved before for a further temporary period. 
There have been, over a, no a significant number of years, a number of delays and legal proceedings relating to the recreation ground. These have related to the 1956 conveyance and the charity commission process, and also a, re a request to designate the site as a town and village green. These have both now been fully resolved. We've heard comments today about the 1956 conveyance, but these are unfortunately simply incorrect. For clarity, the 2002 High Court case was about whether the wording of the conveyance created a charitable trust, and the judge in that case found that a charitable trust had been created. The subsequent litigation around the Charity Commission process between 2014 and 2017 decided what the terms of the charitable trust were, and they created a scheme which was formally adopted in November 2017 as the framework which enables the trustee, now Bath Recreation Limited, to operate the charity as it sees fit in accordance with its charitable objectives. The 1956 conveyance has been fully settled and closed by the 2002 High Court ruling and subsequent Charity Commission tribunals. Bath Recreation Limited own and operate the REC and are fully entitled to the lease land at the REC to generate income. The REC charity scheme explicitly states, and I refer to clause 2.2, which states that for the avoidance of doubt, the preservation of Bath Recreation Ground in specie as an open space is not one of the charitable purposes of the charity. I turn now to provide an update on Stadium for Bath and the 1922 conveyance. As members will be aware, the Stadium for Bath project was launched back in November 2017. As your officers highlighted, significant work was undertaken on the project over the subsequent two years, including a number of consultation events and extensive engagement with officers and stakeholders. However, as a consequence of the global pandemic, in May 2020, it was announced that the project was understandably and rightly paused. More recently, in April 2021, the club confirmed that the previously proposed under-pitch public car park was now removed from the proposals. Moving on, a case was recently heard in the High Court of Justice regarding the 1922 conveyance of the REC. Within this um, conveyance, there was a restricted covenant which, if enforceable, could impact future developments at the REC. In accordance with legal advice, Bath Rugby has for some time been seeking to obtain clarity on this covenant. In December 2021, just before Christmas, the Court of Appeal found in favour of Bath Rugby and Bath Recreation Limited and declared that this covenant was unenforceable. In recent days, we have, however, been notified that certain parties to the case have applied to the Supreme Court seeking to overturn that decision. Bath Rugby and Bath Recreation Limited will challenge that application based on the very clear and emphatic decision of the Court of Appeal. The timings for this process are unclear, and given the clarity of the Court of Appeal's decision in December 2021, it may well be that the application is swiftly rejected by the Supreme Court without a hearing. Turning back now to planning matters, the current officer's report notes that the reason why further permissions have been granted is expressly, and I quote, to allow for a permanent solution for the future of the recreation ground to be resolved. Bath Rugby's resolve to progress with the Stadium for Bath project remains unchanged. Unfortunately though, the delays caused over the past two years by both the pandemic and the various legal processes regarding the 1922 covenant have meant that it has understandably had to be paused. It was hoped that further progress would have been made before the expiry of the current temporary permissions in May of this year. But unfortunately, this has just not been possible, and a further extension is now requested. There is a long history of legal and other statutory challenges relating to the REC. In each case, it is entirely necessary and appropriate for that due process to be followed and completed. These challenges all take time to resolve. And this is an important reason why we sought a four-year temporary permission for these applications, rather than a shorter time frame. It will allow certainty and viability for Bath Recreation Limited, which of course relies on a significant rent from Bath Rugby to deliver its charitable objectives, as well as the public and Bath Rugby itself. It will also ensure that the significant economic, social and cultural contribution that the club makes to the community and to the city can continue, while a permanent proposal for the REC is developed. As your officers note, the planning practice guidance explicitly confirms that temporary planning permission may also be appropriate 
to enable the temporary use of vacant land or buildings prior to any longer term proposals coming forward. And you've heard this morning that's called a meanwhile use. It remains entirely appropriate for a further temporary period to be facilitated. Two, and again using the words in the Council's previous planning conditions, allow for a permanent solution for the future of the recreation ground to be resolved. This ambition reflects the Council's own adopted development plan aspirations within core strategy policy B1 and placemaking plan policy SB2. Also, for clarity, and your officers will confirm, these policies are not being revisited or reconsidered through the Council's local plan partial update, which will be due for examination over the coming months. So, to sum up, these applications are submitted in the spirit of the overall strategy to redevelop the rugby stadium as the permanent long-term home of Bath Rugby Club. Bath Rugby seek consent for a period of four further years, while the matters I've highlighted are concluded and the planning application for a permanent stadium can progress. Finally, it is important to recognise that these proposals have been approved by the Council before. Consistency in decision making runs to the heart of our planning system and there are no changes in circumstances or material considerations that would justify a different outcome. We've heard from a number of objectors today and including unfortunately many inaccurate and incorrect statements but I respectfully request that this committee focuses on planning matters. The proposals comply with the relevant national and development plan policies as has been concluded in previous decisions by the council and indeed in the officer's report before you. We therefore ask members to approve these applications in accordance with your officer's positive recommendation. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you'd like to come back and sit behind me, can I invite Councillor Amanda Rigby to come up to the front to speak? Councillor Rigby, when you're ready. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, hello again, uh, Committee. Um, I'm here as the Ward Member for Bathwick. Um, I've been allocated 15 minutes, but I'm sure you'll be very pleased to know that I don't intend to, to use them all. What I have tried to do is distill all the most pertinent facts into the following statements, and I've concentrated on all the material planning considerations I'd like you to bear in mind. I urge you to listen with an open mind to what I'm asking of you. Some of you were around in 2012, which was the last time that, as a councillor, I was before this committee as Bath Rugby were applying for an extension to their temporary permissions. There have, of course, as the officer pointed out, been many variations and extensions in between. By chance, the speech I made then is one of the ones I still have access to, and I'm struck by how similar it is to what I intend to say today and how similar, in fact, the application in front of you from Bath Rugby is. It talked of needing a fallback position, of circumstances out of their control necessitating an extension. I talked of the need for everyone, no matter who, to abide by planning rules, and the fact that there had been an ongoing delay didn't mean that what was meant to be temporary should, in effect, start to become permanent. At the time, we were assured there would be no further delay in putting in a permanent application, that this was, and this is a quote, the very last time an extension to temporary permission would be sought. As the officer has pointed out, there is no proposed change here to the size, scale and materials, but they were all approved at the time as a temporary measure. They were never thought to be permanent. And yet nearly 10 years later, a couple of extensions later, here we are again. I have absolutely no wish to teach the members to suck eggs, um, but I listened very carefully to the previous debate you had where Councillor Hounsell pointed out that development in the Greenbelt needed special circumstances in the MPPF. This is obviously not in the Greenbelt, but in fact the bar is higher. In the MPPF it states very, very clearly that temporary permissions should only be extended in the most exceptional, not special, exceptional of circumstances. We're all very well aware of the fact of COVID and the impact this has had on all of us. But like the boy who cried wolf, 
Bath Rugby have claimed exceptional circumstances so often it has become completely unexceptional. The claims of why we are yet again in this position differ, and to a certain extent we are where we are, but we are really now stretching any definition of temporary. Yet again, you've been put in a position where you will feel that if you don't accede to this application, you will be responsible for Bath Rugby not being able to play on the rec. The, the responsibility for this state of affairs lies very firmly with those making the application a few months before the current permissions lapse in May 2022, when it had been obvious for a very long time there will be no permanent stadium built by then. You've heard from residents about the complexities of ownerships and the impact the stadium has on their lives, so I'm not going to spend time on, on repeating those legal arguments. I am, however, going to take issue with the statements in the application about consultation with neighbours. Let me give a positive. The actual match day experience has got much better, with a member of staff going above and beyond to try and minimise disruption. But in terms of meaningful engagement on long-term plans and aspiration, both myself as ward councillor and the local residents' associations uh, have been treated with a certain degree of contempt. I would say there's been little respect shown to this committee as well. Many of those who feel very strongly about how both they and the planning system have been treated are rugby season ticket holders and are supporters of the team, even in this very challenging season to be a supporter. And we all appreciate what the foundation contributes to the city. But looking at the specifics in front of you, let, let's first of all look at the temporary nature of the East Stand. Last year, an application was put in to vary the condition, which currently means that it has to be taken down over the summer months. This application was subsequently withdrawn, and we found out via a statement in the press that the club had no intention of complying with this condition. This committee makes the best decisions it can, and it is not in the gift of any person or organisation to arbitrarily and publicly decide it does not intend to abide by them. I trust that whatever decision you make today, the rugby club commits to abiding by it. And whilst giving out a little bit of advice, it would be excellent to have proper communication enabling us from them, rather than refusals to meet and aggressive emails. In your, in your papers, you will see that it says the reason they did not want to take the stand down was in part to protect neighbours from noise and disruption. This is laughable. It is a party day of celebration when the stand is taken down and the historic view across the wreck is revealed. I implore you to keep the condition where this stand must be taken down for three months over the summer. But you do have one very big question you must ask yourselves. If you are persuaded that in effect you can go against the temporary planning applications policy, as I say, exceptional circumstances have to be proved yet again. If you are persuaded you can, should you? We have declared a climate emergency. We've been asked to put in anti-terrorist measures. We have been told to clean up our air. The flood risk in the centre of Bath has been assessed as increased. All these have happened since 2018, and none of these have been accounted for fully in the application in front of you. They don't have to be, you see. It's temporary. I appreciate that Bath Rugby is for many an iconic and intrinsic piece of Bath. You as a committee, to a certain extent, have to be blind to the applicant. You are giving permissions on a piece of land, a piece of historically and environmentally significant land in the middle of the city. Were this application to be from any other organisation, how would you be viewing it? I know one approach you might be considering, to grant an extension, but to say this is the last time that you will do so. I know I certainly wanted to do that when I was on the committee, and I know that you will receive the advice that you're not allowed to do this, that any application must be looked on at its own merits, and you can't preclude another application coming in. And I accept that that is completely true. But it then cuts both ways. You can't stop another application coming in, but neither must you agree that what was deemed suitable for a temporary permission years ago is still appropriate. I hope I've given you enough areas where the world has changed and what was allowable then no longer is. So over to you. Poor timescale planning on behalf of the applicant has yet again created a problem for you. Um, I understand that you may be sitting here considering that you want to approve the application and uh, go along with the officer's recommendation. I have given you much to consider, I hope. But if you are still minded to follow the officer's recommendation, I would absolutely beg you to please add in some conditions. 
And the conditions that I would suggest for you to, to consider are as follows. That you extend the permissions for two, not for four years. That you do not vary any condition requiring the removal of the east stand in the summer months. And three, you require some of the due diligence you would were this to be a permanent application as it is becoming so by default. In practical terms, this would mean a full equalities impact assessment, an updated travel plan to be signed off by the police for the security implications and the sustainable travel team for sustainability, an updated flood risk document in an, an ecological survey, all of which should be done and approved prior to the reconstruction of the East Stand at the end of the summer. I don't envy your decision. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Councillor Rigby. So oh, that's the end of the speakers. We can move on to questions to the officer, and I have Councillor Jackson on my list. Um, thank you very much indeed. Yes, I've got a number of questions, um, partly clarification and partly um, uh, Councillor Rigby has anticipated one or two of the things I think we need to get established if possible. Um, the first question, um, it's my understanding, following my years on this committee, that the actual legal situation with regard to the covenant, the charity commissioner's law and so on is irrelevant um, as far as our actual consideration of this applica application is concerned. We're just looking at, I'm going to say bricks and mortar, but obviously there isn't bricks and mortar. It, we're looking at temporary stands and the implications in legal terms, I understand, are not relevant, but I, I'd like a bit of clarification on that, if that's possible. Um, obviously, COVID has disrupted their plans quite a lot, and there have been delays because of the legal situation. But I was wondering if the officer um, would accept the argument that as they've lost, effectively, they say, lost two years, uh, some of us, of course, are working from home. But anyway, if they've lost two years, it would be reasonable to give this extension of the temporary permission for two years and not four years. But finally, can we tie it down in some way? Um, there surely ought to be a condition that this is a temporary extension valid for X number of years, full stop. I mean, I really don't, assuming I win in the next election, I really don't want to be back here in four years' time looking at it again. So is it possible to have what you might call a timeline condition inserted into it? Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Uh, yes, thank you, Councillor. So uh, just, I, I, I think you, 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 you've got your understanding correct, but I'll, I'll just clarify for, for all members. In regard to the legal uh, sort of matters that have been raised by speakers, the, 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 the detail of, of those is not a material consideration in respect of what we're looking at today. Uh, and you should contain your uh, considerations to planning matters. Um, with the one caveat, and you did sort of uh, pick up on this, is that we're looking at, um, if we're looking at a rationale or a reason uh, for granting a temporary consent, I think there's two parts to that. You've got to look at what has been, particularly where it's a renewal of a temporary consent, you've got to be looking at what's been happening in the previous uh, period of temporary consent and what are the chances of it moving forward uh, within the next period of the temporary consent. And in that respect, um, the fact that the club have been dealing with these legal issues which would uh, reasonably prevent um, a development coming forward and a, a sort of a rational actor would say, well, it, it's quite a reasonable thing for them to hold off investing hundreds of thousands of pounds in a planning application for a redevelopment proposal whilst these legal issues are ongoing. That is, could, could and does in this case form part of the rationale for why further progress hasn't been made, obviously allied to the pandemic and the uncertainty that that has caused in the, in the past two years. Um, so in that narrow sense, those legal issues are relevant, but the actual detail and how they interact with planning, and uh, uh, they're not relevant, and it's, it's planning issues only. Um, on your other uh, questions, um, it would perfectly, it would be within uh, the, this committee's um, power to, 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 to amend the recommendation and grant a two-year consent or a three-year consent. Um, officers are strongly of the view that a four-year consent is the appropriate time frame. Um, 
given obviously, uh, as you say, I don't think anyone wants to be back here looking at this again, if, if at all possible, and we, uh, there is um, a policy desire to uh, see a, a permanent development, uh, redevelopment of the, of the REC. Um, based on where we are now, officers' view are that, uh, as I said in my presentation, uh, 12 months would be a reasonable sort of time frame for expecting a, an application to be submitted and possibly uh, determined. Uh, you know, it, it's a bit difficult to, to estimate. It's, it's forecasting into the future. And then that would likely be subject to uh, the standard condition, which is three years to, to implement that, um, because there's obviously a lot more work that needs to, to, to happen to implement a consent than just getting a planning permission. There's all the land assembly, construction, and and all those details. So on that basis, um, officers feel that four years is, is a reasonable um, time frame for the renewal. And also, as I've explained in the report and through some of the comments I've made, there are justifications for why in the previous um, uh, six years of these temporary consents, except in there were temporary consents before that, there have been an awful lot of challenges that the rugby club have had to overcome to, uh, to bring their uh, redevelopment proposals forward. And then finally, on your last question of um, whether you can uh, sort of put a condition on to, to tie it down and say this is the last one, um, the officer's advice there is, is no, you can't. Uh, that would not meet the test of conditions. It would be unreasonable. Um, the uh, other point is even if you had a, a permission that said no more after four years, um, there would be nothing to stop the applicant in four years' time submitting an entirely new application. Uh, for, a, for a temporary consent, and that would basically be the same thing. We'd be considering the same things again, so it wouldn't serve any useful purpose in that regard. Obviously, the, the committee today can make a clear statement that they, they expect things to move on, but obviously um, that isn't legally binding, as no one knows what circumstances are going to happen in the next four years. Um, so hopefully that answers uh, your questions. Did that answer? You've got a follow-on, Councillor Jackson. Well, yes, because I'm, I'm concerned, thinking on with an enforcement hat on, and um, the fact they apparently are not going to dismantle this stand, but we don't know that. Um, it's going to run over the 12-year limit for enforcement, isn't it? Uh, so we wouldn't be able to do anything if they just left the stands there. Or have I misunderstood enforcement, which I thought after 12 years you couldn't take any action? Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, yes. So uh, in terms of enforcement action, it would be, it's, uh, depending on the type of development we're talking about, it's either four years or 10 years. But that's from the point at which it's unauthorized. So um, currently, all the work down there is, is authorized all the relevant stuff we're talking about because it has consent. So the time limit would only uh, start ticking from the point at which those consents expire, at which point we would obviously be aware of the fact that those would be unauthorised and would be engaging in relevant action. Okay. Councillor Hughes. Thank you. Um, you you've actually answered most of my questions in it already with that, uh, that response, so that's great. Um, but I'm just trying to understand in more detail, I mean, how Bath Rugby intend to use the four years? I mean, is the four years just a, just a finger in the air, or is there a structured plan, a detailed time plan, and some time frames on exactly how we're going to use those four years to give us some sort of reassurance that we will achieve some sense of closure at the end of the four-year period? And perhaps also some reassurance, is there any reassurance that there is also a plan B being worked on should that not succeed? Uh, thank you, Councillor. I think that's a, that's a fair question. Um, there isn't any uh, sort of agreed timetable or plan or uh, program that has been shared with the Council um, specifically around um, the, uh, the, the, the Stadium for Bath proposals. Um, However, there have been to date uh, a number of pre-application engagements. There was a scoping uh, opinion sought back in 2019. Um, there have been the various announcements, I think, uh, there was a news article about the uh, Stadium for Bath uh, dropping the plans for the car park proposal, which was a big sticking point uh, previously. And very recently as well, um, there has been uh, re-engagement from the club in terms of seeking to, to enter into more pre-application uh, discussions with us uh, so that 
that is the usual sort of, uh, uh, it, it sort of proceed, usually precedes an application for planning permission. Now, uh, as, as I've mentioned in my answer before, the, the problem with looking into the future is circumstances change and you, you so there are never any guarantees um, and so we don't have any guarantees that that would necessarily happen beyond the word of the applicant and the evidence of, that they have been making that progress trying to address those legal issues um, uh, and, and, and the, the, the previous pre-application discussions we've had with them. Thank you and, and is there any way of, um, of adding any type of conditions on, on the the submission of pre-apps and, and applications to ensure that we do achieve some sort of um, timeline on this? I, I, I think the, the difficulty is that we're, we're talking about uh, the acceptability of this development and, and so it's a question, it's an interesting question and I'm having to sort of mull it over as I answer but um, I think we'd probably uh, fail to meet the test conditions not being directly relevant to to what's considering. I know there is that link of, well, we, obviously it's a, a meanwhile use. Um, I, I don't think it would be, would be particularly reasonable either, given what I've said about um, circumstances, looking into the future circumstances change. So if we had a condition saying you had to do something by a certain date, if we had another variant of the, 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 pan, uh, the pandemic uh, virus and we all went back into lockdown and all the businesses shut down again, that would potentially force them into a breach of that condition through no fault of their own um, or, or any other number of circumstances. So I, I would be very wary of, of, of that uh, approach. Okay, Councillor Hughes, Councillor Clark. Uh, in, the, um, in your view, but also uh, in any deliberations or uh, an understanding you have from uh, Bath Rugby, should we choose to refuse permission for the extension today what is your understanding of the, the, the likely impact on Bath and their actions thereafter? <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor Clark. Um, obviously, it, 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 uh, I think if uh, permission were to be uh, refused, then obviously we'd be left with a situation where come May of this year, um, the vast majority, although not all, of the um, elements of the stadium on the, on the screen there would, would be in breach of um, their the planning permissions, those temporary planning permissions. Um, and so that would obviously put the rugby club, uh, unless they had removed all of that stuff, that would put them in potential uh, liability for enforcement action from the council. Um, that would obviously be hugely disruptive to their operations. Um, as a rugby club, um, I, no expert, but I don't see how you could operate a rugby club without um, three, or th three or four of the stands. Um, so that would obviously, uh, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't want to go too far into sort of, again, forecasting potential uh, hypothetical scenarios. Um, but obviously, previously, the council has considered that the rugby club does bring a number of benefits to the city in terms of tourism, culture, economic benefits and the like. And obviously, if the operational difficulties presented by uh, the uh, a breach of those consents um, uh, cause the, the club to fail or falter, then th that might have ne negative impacts on all those benefits as well. So it, I'm, I'm, I am, again, this is sort of hypotheticals. C can I just, would there be any cost to the council? Um, uh, it, it's a bit difficult for me to answer that because I'm not aware of, you know, what the, the, all, all of the financial situation, the council tax situation, or anything like that. Um, so I don't know if there are any. Um, but from a planning point of view, I, I wouldn't have thought there would be any um, direct costs to the council. But there may be impacts in terms of, you know, uh, tourism and, and economic impacts, more indirect impacts. Okay, Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Chris. I think you've probably answered this, but I just, are you sort of suggesting that if we went for two years, the chances are we will come back again in two years for another extension because it won't have given them time to see through what they really need to do. So I'm mindful, I've, I heard people say about two years, but I'm mindful that if we go for two years, 
I'm not sure that's going to give them time because you're saying four. Um, is that sort of your thinking without putting words into your mouth? <clears throat> I think, um, uh, well, I think you're basically right there. I think um, my experience is that um, uh, achieving planning permission for uh, a, a significant project such as the Stadium for Bath, um, as controversial as it is as well, um, does take a very long time. Uh, and there are any number of hurdles, obstacles, or changing circumstances that could occur in that time. So two years would seem, uh, from the position we are in now with, without a uh, planning permission in place, would seem quite tight. Um, uh, and, and three or four years, as I said, uh, my recommendation is for four years, would, would make more sense to me. Any other spe uh, questions, Councillor Hansel? Um, right. In the... Um uh, conditions at the moment, it, it talks about um, uh, uh, the development, if it was permitted, uh, to be in accordance with the submitted travel plan dated the August 2014. Um, that that's, has been pointed out, that, that's very old now and out, outdated. Can it be a condition that a, uh, a new updated travel plan, plan is prepared, say, within six months of this decision? Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Hansel. Um, my understanding is the club actually have been updating their travel plan. The most recent um, version uh, was from 2019, uh, just before the pandemic. Um, and we previously looked into this with them and, and, and uh, we, we've accepted that it wouldn't be reasonable for them to, to update their, their, their surveys and travel plan during the period of the pandemic when, uh, when obviously travel patterns were largely disrupted. Um, in terms of uh, amending that condition to the refer to that latest travel plan, I, I think that would be a perfectly reasonable amendment to make to the recommendation, um, if that's something you wanted to pursue. Thank you. Councillor Hodge. Hello, thank you, Chair. I, had, I actually had exactly the same question as um, Councillor Hansel. And, and my second question, I'd, I just wanted to be clear on the, the issue of enforcement and the current conditions. And just to be clear that all the current conditions are being complied with and these standards is being taken down. I don't have, sorry, I don't have knowledge of all these areas but it, as required and there's no possible um, enforcement repercussions um, from us, from conditions not being applied at the moment. Uh, thank you, Councillor Hodge. Um, so uh, just to be absolutely clear, because I know this has come up a couple of times, um, there is currently a condition on the temporary consents to require the East Stand to be taken down um, over the summer of each year. Um, that, condi that condition is actually on item one, which relates to the East Stand as it is in its current position, and item three, which, as I explained earlier, is one of the overlapping ones and has the East Stand in a slightly different condition. But in both cases, that condition is on there and remains unchanged as a result of these. So there would be no impact on that, no implications from granting this temporary consent to that situation uh, whereby uh, there is a requirement for the stand to be taken down each summer. Um, as for um, whether, I'm, I'm not aware of any outstanding sort of uh, uh, breaches of conditions or enforcement action on the site. Um, to be honest, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I, ha I haven't been down there and checked every, uh, every little structure is in exactly the right place, but uh, as I said, I'm not aware that there is any um, breach of, uh, of the conditions or uh, the plans in any way. Uh, and in any case, if there were any, that would be a, a sort of a separate enforcement matter that could be dealt with. And I don't think there are any implications uh, arising from that for you today. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any more questions? How, uh, Councillor McPhee. I'd just like to follow up on Councillor Hughes again. I mean, I, I do feel that we have seen conditions with time limits on them, and you were just discussing some there. So I, I'm not quite sure what he had in mind, but surely there could be a condition that uh, said some plan must have been submitted by a certain date. Um, and some other things must have been done uh, uh, over that three-year period, surely. Um, so uh, I, I sort of come back to the 
uh, six tests of conditions, and uh, I think the one that sticks in my mind is, is relevant to the development being considered. Now, the development being considered here is the temporary stands. Um, if you were to draft a condition requiring um, plans for a stadium of our proposal to be submitted by September this year or something like that, that would not be that would not be relevant to this development. It is that is specifically aimed at that other development. Um, it may be possible um, if you felt it was absolutely necessary um, to amend uh, the recommendation to add a condition uh, to, to require the submission of a indicative program or plan. But I don't think uh, that would that we would be able to say that we would be able to be strictly say that they have to meet that. Uh, plan. I think we would be getting that, in, that as an illustrative uh, plan or program only. Um, again, th that's a little bit of a stretch as I'm not quite sure that's relevant to this development either. But that would possibly be the best that you could, you could achieve is, is getting a, an indicative program or plan to be submitted um, within uh, a few months of, of, of this uh, permission being granted or something to that effect. Councillor McPhee had a follow on. Um, well, I think that that is right, because if, if for example, we go for a four-year system, there's nothing, no, nothing happens for four years. We, we don't see it again. If we can put some deadlines in uh, that certain things should be done, at least it's going to come back and the debate will be had. Yeah, uh, as I said, it, it, it's not my recommendation to go down that route, because I, 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 but if that was a point that the other members of the committee felt strongly about, then I think the, the, the best that could be potentially done is, is an illustrative program. Could, we could require the submission of an illustrative program or plan, um, but we wouldn't be able to make draft the condition in such a way that it would um, require those plan, uh, those sort of uh, milestones within that plan or program to be uh, to be met. Um, otherwise, they'd be in a breach of the implications of that. Would be if they were to breach that program, what would be the the what would be the the outcome? Do they they would they lose their temporary consent? That doesn't that doesn't follow. So, um, my recommendation is that that's not necessary. Um, but as I said, if if there was a, a groundswell of opinion that, that there was a need for something like that. A condition uh, I'd recommend delegating to permit to allow officers to draft a, a condition requiring the submission of an illustrative program for, this, for the uh, submission of a, a permanent stadium proposal. Now, on to your question, Councillor McPhee. Yes, I, I don't have the confidence in my own ability to bring <laughs> that forward, but I just ask that some kind of delegated um, to permit if we if we do go with some time limits on it, is brought forward. Okay, do we have any more questions? Councillor Appler, I don't know you want to speak in the debate. Do you have a question? Did you want to ask a question? Okay, so do we have any other questions? Councillor Jackson. Well, I think um, pre previous councillors have put their finger on an extremely difficult situation. We want to see this come forward, but on the other hand, circumstances might arise that might make it quite impossible, like financial problems as a consequence of the war in Ukraine. So I was just wondering if the officer would consider a slight tweak on the first condition. Um, what we've got here, it reads, reads uh, this is about uh, it being only temporary reason the proposed development is of a design and construction that the council will permit only for a limited time a limited period to allow for a permanent solution for the future of the reg, reg, recreation ground to be resolved just to add within a reasonable time frame we just added those four words i think it would wrap up both our intentions and what we expect the club to do within reason because otherwise they're just going to appeal anyway that we're being unreasonable I think w would the officer agree just add on the end of the first condition with within a reasonable time frame 
Um, so suggestion is to, to add uh, something to the reason uh, of that condition uh, and presumably similar wording to be applied to the uh, condition, relevant conditions on items two and three as well. Um, that doesn't affect the operative part of the condition and, and therefore it wouldn't change uh, the, the, the lawful status of that condition. Uh, it, it, it may well be the statement of intent from, from the, the councillors as well. So um, uh, that would be open to you to do. Um, it's not my recommendation. I don't think it's, it's necessary, but um, if that's something the committee felt strongly about, I'm sure that would be uh, something that could be added. Okay, are we done with questions? Grilling, Chris. Yeah, so we can move to the debate. I have Council Appleyard down on my list. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> uh, it's an interesting set of questions. Um, I think the one thing that actually unites most of the speakers and the, um, the players in this particular piece is frustration. There's certainly a frustration from residents about the uncertainty of what's happening on there, whether they want rugby, whether they don't want rugby. Um, there's certainly frustration from the Recreational Trust who have um, had to deal with the legal challenges that have gone on to establish their position. Uh, they've also want to have um, a secure tenant on the site. And bearing in mind, the rugby club aren't the only tenant on the site. We as a councillor are tenant on that site with, our, with the sport clubs that, 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 that's there. And plus there's other users. Um, the club itself is frustrated because it wants to get a permanent and quality site to produce uh, quality rugby, something that we desperately want. And then there's frustration from us because, you know, we, we try and do the right thing and we're trying to drive a solution forward through the planning process. Um, one of the speakers mentioned, uh, you know, what's happened in the last sort of uh, few years uh, that, that, that has changed. Well, for a start, we've, we've declared a climate emergency, which raised a conversation around the car parking and, uh, and, the, and the club have recognised that and that it's been indicated that they've taken that out there. So they want to drive to a solution that actually suits everybody. Um, we've had a pandemic. Now that's obviously knocked everything on the head. It's impacted on availability of people to do, to do their job, to move it forward. And we also had um, the, the court challenges that the Recreational Trust have actually experienced. And that's affected the, the progress of something like this. Um, I think the question it seemed to be around the table is not whether we actually give, a, give an extension on this, it's actually, actually for how long. And I do give a lot of weight to the officer's recommendation and, and, and the experience of the officer who deals with a lot of our major developments in the city, our big, big ticket items in there and his ability to understand that process that uh, if it's gonna take maybe up to 12 months to get a good planning application in and across the line with all the negotiations that go on there, we've also got to give the club sufficient time to negotiate with a builder, a contractor, to deliver that, you know, that, that finished article and we know how um, difficult it is to engage with builders at the best of time, but that, that level is a completely different thing as well. So I do err on whether, you know, sort of, you know, when people are saying about two years, I, I think it will come back to us again, without a doubt, because I don't think that gives sufficient time and we don't want the club to rush into a makeshift solution. We want a quality solution and so, whether it be three years or four years, on balance, I will go with the officer's recommendation, and I'm quite happy to propose we, propose we follow the officer's recommendation and allow the, uh, uh, the, 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 basically follow his recommendation to approve for the four year period on that. So are you proposing a motion? What? Are you proposing a motion, Councillor yeah. Appleyard? Yeah, well, yeah, yes. I mean, and then it opens up for the debate because uh, I think it's the timing that people are, <laughs> are concern, concerned on. 
And, and I think, um, given what the officer has said and his experience on how long it takes for these things to be put in place, because it's, it's not as though I should imagine the club's got everybody lined up, um, ready to go from day one. They've got to build that team. And, and I think we've got to give them sufficient time to do that. But we're also giving the club a very clear message that subject to nothing major happening, that at the end of that four years time, we were expecting to see that progress happening. So just to be clear, you are proposing a motion to accept the officer's recommendation as laid out here. Do I have a seconder for that? Councillor Davis. Okay, we will continue the debate. I'll have Councillor Hughes next. Thank you. Um, so, so yes, I think looking at the issues that have been raised, I think first of all, obviously the, the travel plan and the climate emergency issues are, are very important. But it, I think it's also very important to understand that we are a tourist destination and we actively encourage tens of thousands of people to come to our city every year. And I think the attendance um, to, to Bath Rugby is around about 125,000 people a year come to the city um, and use our hospitality and our hotels and all our other facilities. So, so I think that uh, there's a balance there, but I think it's important to understand that it's part of a much bigger picture. We have various other, we have sporting events such as the Bath Half Marathon, which brings in probably about 50,000 people to the city. Um, and also raises about, as up to, to date, has raised about 30 million pounds for charities. Um, so, and also, I mean, I think it would be, it would be detrimental to the city, for the city to lose Premiership Rugby. I think it's something that the city are rightly proud of, and I think it's something that we need to, um, we, we need to protect. Having said that, I mean, obviously, I, I've already raised the concerns that I have. I think four years needs to be a maximum, and I, and I am worried that without any conditions, that four-year period, could, there could be some complacency and some dragging of heels where we really need to see this brought to some sort of conclusion within that four-year four period, and hopefully in less than four years. But, uh, I mean, broadly, I support the, the officer's recommendation for four years as a maximum, because I think that probably is the maximum that's needed to find a solution. Okay, thank you. Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you. I think I understand the concerns about going from two to four years, but I think the officer has made it very clear why we need to follow that recommendation. Um, I'd be quite happy to take into consideration the point that Councillor Hounsell made about, the, I think it's 2019 travel plan, that we could adjust that bit. I don't know if Councillor Appleyard would be willing to do that, if that was appropriate. Um, and I would be, you know, I understand what you're saying, Councillor Hughes, but I don't think there is a, we've asked the question and there isn't really a condition that we can put on that's relevant to this application in front of us. And I think that's what we're finding quite frustrating, that the condition we would like to put in isn't relevant to the application as it stands in front of us. So therefore, I'm quite happy to uh, second the uh, motion. Thank you. Councillor Bromley. Can, can I, sorry, can, can I just say I'm quite happy to accept that condition in my proposal? Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I, I, having listened to all the, the residents' concerns, I mean, I, I can understand how they feel and it, it must be very frustrating for them, these endless extensions. And having said that, the last four years has, has been an exceptional period of time with the pandemic and the court case. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I do feel that uh, with, with all the considerations of a new, maybe a new um, application and the time it will take to get something in place, it would seem that four years is a, is a, is a, a reasonable extension. Anything less than that, uh, you know, we're going to be coming back with this same case all over again. I mean, I just wondered actually, um, bearing in mind we have the new city centre security plan, if there could be uh, an updated security plan attached to, to this, you know, to um, because obviously the wreck is right in the centre of Bath. Um, this would seem to me to be a, a reasonable condition, really. Um, and also just to support Councillor Hughes's um, comments about the, the value that Bath Rugby brings to the city centre in terms of 
um, enjoyment for, for the, the local residents, apart from even people we bring from, from outside. And also, of course, the financial considerations, um, support for local businesses and restaurants. So I would therefore like to support the officer's recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Bromley. I, I'll just interject with, from my personal point of view, I, I would rather be sitting here in two years' time with a half-built stand and agree to an extension because I haven't got, I need another two years to do it than be back here in four years with nothing happened again. But I hear what you're saying. Councillor Clark. Uh, I was uh, quite impressed with Councillor Rigby's uh, statement and what she was saying, pulling, uh, drawing our attention to the fact that we should be considering on planning, not commercial terms as I understand it, we should be considering this application on planning and the fact that it's of tremendous financial benefit to not only Bath Rugby Club but also to Bath um, is not something that I think is a consideration for the planning committee. And when I tell you I'm a rugby uh, loving person and obviously therefore uh, would not like to see Bath Rugby Club not uh, be um, playing in Bath. Uh, the fact of the matter is I do implore the executives and the owners and the financial backers of Bath Rugby Club to look very closely at their plans for the future and try and be straight with the people of Bath in terms of what their plans are. Uh, because um, I do think they've had a lot of time now to really decide exactly what they want to do. I understand there's been lots of problems. I do think that going forward, um, whatever happens, they really should come up with a plan and whatever's approved or not approved today, they should stick to it. Uh, it is, I mean, many people here will know that, for example, uh, Wasps, uh, Wasps uh, uh, Rugby Club have in fact, they could have renamed themselves the Nomads. They moved, they moved around so much. Uh, Saracens moved. I played at uh, Saracens, and they moved from Southgate, where I played, and I think they now play up at Coventry, I think. They've moved. Um, I think that's where they are anyway. They've moved around. So clubs do move around, and I think it's very important, uh, bearing in mind everything that's been said here, I think it's very important, as I say, the management and the financial backers of Bath Rugby Club do actually keep, and now, if this is approved, in whatever way, then they go back to their offices now and start working pretty promptly on their plans, in fairness to everybody, particularly the, the residents who are affected, but to everybody in the Bath area. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Councillor Hounsell. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll try to be brief. Um, uh, yeah, I think uh, Councillor Clark is absolutely right. We've got to decide this on planning grounds. I think the exceptional circumstances or most exceptional circumstances uh, are covered by referring to the, uh, the, the pandemic. Um, uh, certainly that, that's had a, a major impact on, uh, on so much. Um, uh, I, I accept that we can't uh, put uh, timelines into our decision. Uh, but uh, we've got representatives of the uh, Bath Rugby Club here, and I'd just like to amplify points made by Councillor Hughes and Councillor Clark about the need for an indicative program or a timeline. Just to use a, a, a bit of jargon, if I was um, uh, the owner, I would want the chief executive as soon as possible to produce what's called a critical path analysis, which is those, those uh, sequence of steps that um, uh, have to be done. Uh, and that gives a length of time for the project. Some other activities can, can slip, uh, but you can still fulfill um, the, the, the project uh, deadline. Um, so we, uh, uh, if I was the owner, I would expect uh, the, um, uh, the senior uh, employees to be working on a, a very, very solid plan. And it's not as though they're starting from scratch, because although we're planning application uh, was um, uh, withdrawn, uh, a lot will have been learned from that. So it's not that you're beginning with a, a, a blank sheet. Uh, I, I would have preferred uh, three years rather than four years, but I, I don't feel strong enough about that. So I will um, support the motion. Uh, so, uh, and it does now include um, 
the condition that, of an updated uh, travel plan. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hanksville. Councillor McPhee. Yes, I just don't think it's uh, good enough to give them four years. I think, they, as Councillor Rigby said, they'll just go back and uh, proceed. I, I think three, um, if it was two, we may be confident that they won't actually get there in that time, but at least there will be an effort and then there will be a decision uh, uh, meeting it in two years. So I, I will oppose the four year motion. Thank you, Councillor McPhee. Councillor Hodge? Yes, I agree with Councillor McPhee. I'm, I'm, it's a very difficult decision. I'm very conflicted about it. And I do support giving the rugby club more time, you know, in recognition of the pandemic and the legal issues that um, have been looked at. Um, but I am not comfortable with giving them another four years. And I think it will be taken to the wire and we'll have the whole situation sitting there for four years and, and a good solution being delayed. And I think hoping that they will resolve things more quickly than that isn't good enough really so i am conflicted but i am going to vote against councillor appiard's proposal and i would prefer three years okay uh councillor hansel uh, just very briefly uh, as two other councillors have referred to three years i i, I will correct uh, change what I, what I said and actually i will vote against this and, and support a three-year period okay thank you well if this motion falls then councillor appiard you can, I point, can i point out there isn't a three-year option on the table it's only a four-year at the moment sorry your motion is for four years which is what we're voting on councillor jackson i'm sorry i think four years is too long and i really fear that as things stand and we've got to look at the application before us and vote on that we will be back in four years time uh, there's a theological term eschatology this is the doctrine of the last things you give people a deadline and in secular terms and um, it may be very short indeed you've just got to get your act together and take that into account and Unless we put some sort of pressure, either I'm quite happy with three years or two years would be even better uh, because that's the amount of time they say they've lost, um, we should be back here again. Uh, and then, of course, the other we're making assumptions about Bath Rugby that I'm not convinced, as I always look at what the results are every Saturday, um, you know, that, that they are actually going to remain in the premiership or, you know, the, the company might not be able to carry on I mean I hope it does but might not be able necessarily to carry on at the level that it currently is doing so um, you know I think we've got to look at the bricks and mortar and say get it sorted in the next three years thank you councillor Jackson councillor Hughes yeah I mean I understand the arguments for both three and four years but I personally think that four years provides a certain amount of certainty um, to get the job done and I I wouldn't like to be back here in an earlier period than that, um, discussing whether, um, where we are in, in, in part of a, a build program or part of a, um, a planning application. I think, I think on balance, I think four years is probably, um, as the officers recommended, is, is the time scales that are needed to make this happen. Thank you. Anybody else want to contribute to the debate before we move on to the vote? No? Chris, could you get the first item up? This vote will be against the first variation. So the motion we have on the table is to support the officer's decision for a four-year extension, temporary uh, permission, proposed by Councillor Appleyard, uh, seconded by Councillor Davis, and I believe that this will then be a delegated permit with a travel plan in. Was that the, um, a, a security plan has also been mentioned. Sorry, I can't, that's Councillor Bromley. Uh, are, are you happy, willing, prepared to accept that into your motion as well? Uh, I need to understand that. Councillor Bromley, would you like to explain what you asked for? 
Well, um, because we have a new city centre security plan um, and the REC is in the centre of Bath, um, I would think if we're going to grant an extension of, of four years, they should, this should be included and they should put forward a security plan for how they plan to deal with the crowds and um, risk to crowds and uh, um, that sort of thing. Uh, sorry, can I just go, go revert to the officer a moment, please, Councillor Appiard? Uh, uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, just on that point, uh, the, the existing temporary consents obviously don't uh, have any requirement for a security plan. And my understanding as um, a, a large venue, um, they, with large crowds, they would be subject to various legislation, health and safety requirements, uh, consultation liaison with the police as they do at the moment. So um, I feel those matters are, are, are likely best, des best dealt with outside of the planning system. Um, furthermore, I don't think we have, uh, I may be incorrect, but I, I couldn't think of an appropriate policy hook uh, f within our planning policies uh, for which to require such a security plan. But as I said, I think the main point is it's, it's covered by other bits of legislation, health and safety legislation in large, relating to large crowds. So my recommendation would be not to include that. Are you okay with the proposal of the travel plan, Chris? Yes, yeah, so um, uh, condition eight um, of each of the uh, items cause is, relates to a travel plan and that could be uh, reasonably amended via delegated to permit to, to, up, to require an updated uh, travel plan. That's a reasonable sort of condition, I would say. Okay, so it's with the travel plan. So we are voting on the first item, 05528 variation, for delegate to permit for a period of four years and to include an uh, updated travel plan. Everybody clear? Those in favour? It's five in favour. Against? So uh, it requires my carrying vote and I will vote against to say I, a period of four years to sit here in four years time with nothing having happened doesn't feel acceptable. Um, if everything can't be done in two years or three years, which if anybody wants to bring that motion forward now, um, I think if we're voting again on a further extension, I would feel much happier doing it seeing that something has been done uh, on the rack. So that motion has fallen. Do we have another motion to put forward, Councillor Hounsell? I, I propose uh, the same motion as before, but with three years rather than four years. Thank you, Councillor Hounsell. Do I have a seconder for that? Councillor Hodge? Yes, I'm pleased to accept that. Second that motion put forward by Councillor Hansel with the conditions that we had With before. the travel plan? Yeah. So, would anybody like to comment or debate on that before we move to a vote on that variation? No? So, delegate to permit for an extension of three years with the travel plan. All those in favour? That is unanimous, Chair. Thank you. Uh, now, if we could have item two up, please, Chris. Could I ask somebody um, to propose a motion, or do we have any further debate on this one? So, Councillor Davis is happy to propose the same motion, Councillor Davis, on yeah. item two. Is anybody prepared to second that? Councillor Clark. Anybody wish to contribute anything to the debate on this one? That is for three years, Councillor McPhee. No? Okay, could we have uh, all those four? That is unanimous, Chair. Thank you. And item three, please. Again, anybody want to say anything additional on this one? Do you want to contribute to the further on the debate for this one, Councillor Appiard? No. So do we have anyone to propose a motion? Councillor Jackson and second, Councillor Bromley. 
All those in favour, three years. That is unanimous, Chair. Thank you, everybody. Um, I think we've uh, reached a good compromise there. Um, so it's uh, quarter to two. Um, I'd like to, uh, obviously, you're supposed to be back at two, but you need a lunch break. So uh, can I ask you to be back at, well, if I give you 40 minutes, that's 20, what, what's 40 minutes from now? <laughs> 25 past two. Please be at your desks, 25 past two. Thank you, everyone. Okay, afternoon everybody. Thanks for coming back on time. Apologies to all members of the public, speakers, etc., which have been waiting for us to restart. We had a long morning and uh, needed some food, so uh, sorry about that. So on to the next item, which is Church Farm, Church Lane, Priston. Uh, if I could just turn to the officer to start her presentation when she's ready. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So this proposal relates to an application for two dwellings following the demolition of equestrian barns. The proposal is located at Church Farm, Church Farm in the village of Priston. So here we have the site location plan with the proposal site shown in red and an aerial imagery of the site. Uh, again, the site shown edged in red. For context, I've also included a plan showing the housing development boundary for Priston, which is marked by the heavy black line, and the site is here marked by the black dot. So this is a topographic plan of the site, which shows the existing two um, buildings in situ, here and here. <coughs> And this plan shows the proposed floor plans. Um, so, as I said, uh, the barns will be demolished and replaced with two dwellings. Um, we've got the ground floor plan here, first floor plan and roof plan, and both dwellings will be four bedroom. And then this plan shows um, the proposed um, roof plan with the... Um, outline of the original buildings marked on by the um, heavy dotted line. And then this shows the existing elevations on site. And then the proposed elevations for plot one and plot two. <coughs> and then we have the um, sort of context elevations with the very faintly um, the existing buildings marked on um, so you can just see the ridge of the barns there and the curve and then the the yellow line marks the height of um, surrounding buildings sorry the orange line um, <coughs> excuse me and then finally, um, some site photos. This is taken um, at the top of the site entrance, moving down uh, towards the buildings. Here, looking at the existing buildings on site. And then this is the, um, uh, the curved building looking through to um, the bigger barn. And then this is looking back up towards the village. So you can see some of the dwellings in the background. And this is taken from the field behind. Again, you can see um, the village for context. You've got a house here and the uh, tower of the church there. So the application is recommended for permission as outlined in the officer's report. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Sam. Um, OK, on to speakers. We have a slight change to the list of speakers. Um, 
Councillor Robert Davies has been added on, whose um, application to speak has just been tracked down to one of the council's spam folders. So he has been added on, um, and I assume the other person we have at the front is Niels Cross. So if I could ask uh, Councillor Davies first to speak, when you're ready. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I've circulated a, a plan and an explanation of that uh, to councillors, which you might find helpful. Uh, there are many objections to this planning application, which the Paris Council, the CPRE, and many residents have raised, um, and to which uh, a later speaker will refer. But I just want to concentrate on one aspect, a fundamental aspect, which is the question of previously developed land. The case officer agrees with the parish council that this proposal is, is not justifiable under GB2 because it lies outside the housing development boundary and is not infill. Uh, the only grounds on which it could be permitted are derived from the NPPF, uh, which allows development in the Greenbelt on uh, uh, on previously developed land and this is his claim to be as it has an equestrian use. Uh, in their report Baines proposed two uh, grounds on which this uh, uh, proposal should be accepted. The first there is claimed to be um, a certificate of lawful use in place confirming that the whole of the site is in equestrian use and second because Baines concedes that there may be some ambiguity, which is their term, uh, surrounding this uh, certificate of lawful use. Uh, the, the issue was clarified by a visit to site by an officer uh, who established that there was evidence of horse activity all over the, uh, the area um, proposed for development, including uh, horse paraphernalia, paraphernalia and hay in a barn. Um, and it, it enabled Baines to come to the conclusion that the whole development site was in equestrian use. So those two grounds on which the proposal is, accept, uh, is, is, is supported by Baines. The parish council uh, contests both these points. Firstly, the certificate of lawful use does not actually cover the major part of the development site. Um, the case officer actually refers to a very early plan which dates from the 25th of November 2004, but this is superseded by a much later plan from the 6th of July 2005, which is close to the determin determination date, and, and this latter plan supersedes the earlier one, and it clearly shows that most of the area of the proposed development lies outside the area delineated by the Certificate of Lawful Use. To explain a little further, the process of the Certificate of Lawful Use was triggered by a planning application uh, to construct a manege, which is a horse exercise yard, not a term I'd come across before, um, on, on the site. And this application had to be withdrawn because the land uh, on which it's situated was not classified as a, of equestrian use. equestrian use. It was classified as agricultural. Um, the, 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 seal, the, the certificate of lawful use was therefore applied for and, uh, the, and a second successful application was made um, for the manege, um, which is actually tied to uh, the plan from July 2005. And this is the plan which I presented to you before this meeting. Sorry, could you, your time is up. If you could um, bring your... Comments to uh, a close? Just one minute for more, okay. Um, so this map clearly shows that um, the d proposed development site lies uh, largely outside the area of um, permitted use under equestrian, under the equestrian uh, scheme. Uh, uh, I'm going to have to... What, can I make one more point, please? Uh, <laughs> Bain's second line of support, that the evidence from the site that it confirms that the entire area is in equestrian use is incorrect. Um, uh, uh, sorry, I am going to have to stop you there because it's not fair on other people if you have more time than another person. So I would can like I to make just one more point. No, sorry, sorry, I think you've made your, your 
point clear. Sorry about that. I have to be fair to everybody. Could you turn your micro microphone off, please? Um, now, if I could have Niels Cross. Is that on? Good. Um, firstly, I would like to fully endorse the objections raised by Councillor Davies. But my objections concentrate on some of the major issues raised previously with the planning department, but not addressed within the very long list of 18 conditions proposed by the case officer. I believe that some of these issues must be resolved prior to granting any approval and not just added to the list of conditions. There must be a confirmation that the site area shown on the drawings for this application is the only area in the whole of the Menage site, which is much bigger, that may be developed at any time. There is no confirmation regarding the possible continued operation of the manège on the rest of the site. Um, by continued use, this would negate the statement that there would be no increase in traffic on the access road and would entail the construction of new stables somewhere else on that site. There are no levels or dimensions given on the drawings to locate the development and buildings, the development and its buildings relative to the existing site. This means that there's no basis for any subsequent argument with the developer that the buildings are not at the correct level or in the correct position. No attempt has been made to provide any details to address the well-known issues of significant flooding from off-site water given that the scheme changes the flood situation and that an existing functional storm drain is believed to pass under the proposed buildings. The proposed planning condition 11 is no totally inadequate and only relates to on-site drainage. A satisfactory overall scheme will probably not be achievable without major on- and off-site works. There are no proposals whatsoever for a viable foul drainage scheme including how it would be connected off-site to the village draining system, drainage system, possibly via adjacent properties. This will be a significant operation. There are no proposals whatsoever for provision of services, which will probably have to be routed via adjacent properties. There are no proper details for the proposed upgrade of the shared access road and no conditions applied on its quality. There is no mention whatsoever in Condition 7 relating to contamination in the, of the fact that the existing main barn has an aging, large asbestos roof and that dem demolition would have to be carried out in compliance with all current legislation, particularly in relation to asbestos removal. Resolving the above issues would mean significant disruption to adjacent properties over and above those related to demolition and new build. And for those reasons, I believe that either there should be a straight um, no to this scheme as proposed, or they have to put in some more details to make it acceptable. Thank you. Your time is up. Thank, Thank you. you. Can I ask you to come beh back behind me, please? Uh, and could I ask Matt Bollen to step up to the front? Yep, when you're ready, if you'd like to turn the microphone on. Thank okay. you. Hi, my name is Matthew Bollin, and I have been involved in the design process throughout. As architects, we've, we have assisted our clients with this site for many years now. Our colleague, and my colleague, who unfortunately isn't here, is a, uh, is a planner, and he has been um, looking at this site from the architectural and planning perspective throughout this process. The pre-app response from the council planners was very positive, which enabled our clients to move forward with the scheme. The local authority planners have visited the site and confirmed the site, as previously discussed, included both barns and the menage is of equestrian use. 
The original scheme was for three dwellings to replace existing barns. This was withdrawn following lengthy discussions with the case officer because it was felt to be too high and too contemporary. We then re redesigned a smaller scheme, mainly single story, with much smaller than, which is much smaller than the existing barns for two detached dwellings using vernacular materials. The building footprint areas and volume is much smaller than the original barns. This is the scheme you have in front of you. This has gone through a lengthy consultation with consultees and I believe all the consultees' issues have been overcome and any objections resolved. The final items refer, uh, reference materials were clarified and surface water drainage with engineer design a scheme which is to the satisfaction of the case officer and the consultees. This process has taken a few years but I believe that during this time the design has evolved and delivered a scheme which blends in with the surroundings. The client's neighbour, the neighbour, the site and, believe that the new and I believe the new design will remove the large barn and improve the sight lines. The, plan, uh, the, the planner's report shows we have held lengthy discussions and I would ask that you support the case officer's recommendations to permit the scheme. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. If you'd like to come back and sit behind me. Um, questions to the officer, Councillor Jackson. Uh, it says something about the sustainability of this site that I am not familiar with it at all because buses don't go through it very often. Um, what I would like to know, if you wouldn't mind, please, uh, there's a statement in the officer's report that there is no impact on the neighbours and, and residents' amenity, but I'm not clear. If you could show the slide again, please, of the layout of the proposed houses, um, because I did wonder if they weren't um, too close to each other, bluntly. And secondly, could you possibly show us the menage again, because I don't quite get the relationship of that to the proposed development. Yep, so um, it's probably easiest to get the context on from the site plan. Um, <clears throat> so these are the, the two barns here, so you can see the red line includes the access and it, it goes around the uh, two barns only. Um, the menage is sited just here, which is within the blue line, so it's in the um, applicant's ownership, but outside of the the red line boundary. Um, so the proposed layout, um, <coughs> probably the, the roof plan's um, quite a good one to, to look at. So you've got sort of a L-shaped um, plot two, and then plot one is more of a T-shape. Um, so both have got um, amenity space to the rear of, of each. Um, and Whilst the uh, the boundary is close, um, there's there's no windows sort of along uh, this this little little part of the site here, um, so they they're not going to overlook directly into each other from from the, these two walls, um, and then obviously the, this sort of part of the site is um, the sort of shared driveway and, and the frontage of the site, so it's more the the sort of street as as you'd you know expect with um, with any any sort of set of dwellings really. Um, so I felt that the uh, residential amenity between the two um, was acceptable. Um, and then you can see the, the, the rest of the village is sort of set um, to the east and south um, and then won't, won't be any overlooking in those directions either. But you can't, even, you can't get a wheelbarrow between the two houses. It's a very narrow passage, is that right? Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty narrow gap. I mean, they're not conjoined, so they're not, they're not, um, they are detached, but, but yeah, a small, only a small gap is maintained between the two at this point. Okay, Councillor Jackson, to answer your question. Well, I, I am generally struggling, but uh, if I don't get a bit more enlightenment, I think I'll propose um, a site visit. Okay, anybody got any questions? Councillor McPhee. Um, the, the substance of the objection of the first speaker was that most of the area of proposed use 
is actually outside the equestrian area. How, how do you respond to that? Yeah, um, well, my report sets out um, the reasoning for why I've found um, the application to be on previously developed land. Um, as the um, objector mentioned, there is a certificate of lawfulness on the site for equestrian use. There's some ambiguity about where that, um, that exactly pertains to. That was granted um, in 2004. Um, since that time, the applicants provided um, details of um, uh, uh, agreements with, with people who have rented the stables and so on, and, and photographs. Um, and at my site visit, um, I found like, equestrian um, paraphernalia at the site, so I was satisfied that uh, it was you know, being used um, for equestrian purposes. Sorry, have you got follow-up, Councillor McPhee? I'd, I would support a site visit if there was a proposal made. Well, we'll get, get on to that with the debate, I think. Councillor Bromley. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, there was talk in the report um, about uh, septic tanks being used, which are contrary to policy, and then later on they're, they're not mentioned again. I just wondered what, what was happening with the drainage and sewage system there. Yeah, sorry if that's not clear in the report. I think um, during the course of the application, the um, applicants um, confirmed that it won't be uh, a septic tank that's being used. Um, so um, the flooding and drainage team um, uh, were consulted and, and didn't raise any objection. Okay, Council Hodge. Thank you. Um, I've, I've just got some minor kind of side questions. I just wanted clarifying. The, um, on some of the consultee reports, there's still scope for revision. I, I didn't have a chance to follow up and see whether those questions have been answered. So the drainage and flooding um, team wanting more information, scope for revision, and the ecology team um, wanting more information. But that might have been resolved since your report. And the other thing I wanted to just check was um, there is a the lighting trigger, that there is a um, lighting condition, but um, they say Priston is, a, a, is designated a dark, kind of uh, you know, maintaining dark darkness um, village. And do you then tailor the, the trigger, the lighting condition to that? Because it's, it's obviously standard wording that might be used for a house, you know, in the center of a city, and it doesn't talk about, um, the village being a dark village, so I'd, are the, is, there, is, it, is the condition reflective of that particular situation? Thank you. Yeah, so during the course of the application, the ecology and drainage were both reconsulted and did confirm um, no objection, so their scope for revision was removed and, and it, uh, they proposed no objection subject to conditions. Um, so the lighting condition is the, the wording I've used is um, the wording of the ecology officer um, and it, it does require no, no external lighting without details being submitted. So um, it would be that, that that would be assessed at the time of, of the, the, sub, the submission of those details. Um, but uh, it could potentially be um, amended uh, if, if necessary. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Any more questions from anybody? Is that a question, Councillor Jackson? Yeah, carry on. Uh, well, we've been discussing whether this is um, a developed site or not indirectly. On, I'm looking at page 130. And um, what is the difference between a brownfield site, like, you know, a derelict industrial unit, let's say, um, and these barns and the menage area, I mean, the fact they've been used for exercising horses, uh, doesn't, I'm, not sure, I'm not convinced that's development, so I wondered what the definition was, please. Yeah, so equestrian um, use does fall within the definition of previously developed land um, the same way that industrial uses do or retail uses, etc. Um, so it meets that definition of brownfield. Okay, Councillor Jackson. <laughs> but your question is answered. Any more questions for anybody before we move to the debate? No? So who would like to start the debate? 
Anybody? Councillor Davis. If no one else is keen, we've got to start somewhere. Um, I'm actually quite happy to uh, accept the officer's recommendation um, because it's quite clear that, the, that this will replace the barns that are there and it's not as high as the, the plan showed um, where she'd marked in the, the lines. Although somebody did say that they didn't know the height and so on, but obviously it's clear from the plans that we were shown they do know those sorts of things. Um, so I'm quite happy to move that we uh, go with the officer's recommendation. Okay, would I second that? Is that you, Councillor Jackson, seconding? No, it's me proposing a site visit because I don't feel I can vote for this without seeing the site. Okay, so you'll have the chance to propose that if this one falls and other people obviously will not vote for this one if they also want a site visit. Will anybody second this motion? Councillor Hounsell? I'll second the motion. Okay. So, uh, we have a motion on the table to support the officer's decision. Before we take a vote on that, do we have any more contributions to the debate? Councillor Hodge? Um, I, I'd just like to say, I have some, would support a site visit as well. And that, can I say that at this stage? And I, I have some cons concerns about the, um, that key point of what is permitted in the green belt and whether it is previously developed land. And I find it hard to um, come to a decision on that based on the information that's in front of us. So um, that's why I won't be supporting the motion. Any more contributions to the debate, Councillor Jackson? Well, I, I don't know. I, f I feel that Priston Parish Council have made a valid case and we ought to take it much more seriously. And I can't see that knowing that Priston is a sustainable site. I mean, it's not so much that the Morris Dancing Group has collapsed after I don't, 100 years or whatever it was because they can't find any uh, more volunteers to join it and support it. It's um, the fact that you would have to commute to work from here and um, it's just not sustainable in terms of communications and it does actually say that somewhere in the report. And so I'd have to vote against this motion, I'm afraid. Thank you. Do we have any more contributions to the debate before we do a vote? No? So the motion we have on the table is to support the officer's recommendation to permit, proposed by Councillor Davis, seconded by Councillor Hansel. All those in favour? That's four in favour. And against? Five against. And abstentions? One abstention. So that has fallen. Okay, back to the debate. Or any other motions anyone might like to? Councillor Jackson? Sorry, can you put your mic on? Site visit, please. Okay, and do we have a seconder for that? Councillor Bromley. Anybody else like to speak before we move to the vote on that? No? Okay, so the motion we have, proposed by Councillor Jackson, seconded by Councillor Bromley, is to have a site visit. All those in favour? Seven in favour. And against? Absent None against. Oops. Sorry, abstentions. Three Three. So that one is carried. Thank you very much. Site visit lined up for next committee meeting. Thank you, Sam. So if we could just do the officer switch over, please, for the next application.
Okay, thank you. If the officer could give us a presentation. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, this application is uh, it's a dual application for the installation of solar PV panels and a ground source heat pump um, within the eastern paddock um, of uh, Manor House and Waterloo Lane uh, Burnett, um, in addition to uh, uh, the connection of pipe work um, within the lower ground floor plant room. So the first slide here, um, you can see um, on the, the left-hand side is, is a block plan. Um, th this block plan is actually zoomed in on the, um, uh, on, of the site plan of uh, Manor House itself and, the, um, and, it, and its surrounding uh, curtilage. Um, Manor House, is, uh, I should mention, is a, a Grade 2 listed building. On the, on the right, you see a, a zoomed-out location plan showing the... Um, uh, the um, sort of a wider estate um, and the paddock in question is the land uh, to the east and north of uh, the main re uh, residential coastage. So this is a uh, plan outlining sort of the main constraints. You can see the, um, uh, the, 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 sort of the built up uh, form of, of, of this of this part of uh, of, of Burnett, um, including the uh, the green uh, listed out uh, um, outlines of uh, of Manor House, and you've also got um, St Michael's Church immediately to the north. This one, this is a um, topographical survey. Unfortunately, you can't see the um, the uh, the um, the figures on this on this plan, but hopefully, it's sort of. Gives you, it gives an outline as to, as to sort of the, uh, the layout of the trees um, within the site. This is a proposed location plan. Uh, you, you've, you've got the um, uh, the, the, um, the PV array uh, within that sort of square um, in the top, top northeast corner. And this is the layout of the um, proposed. Uh, PV array. This is a section here of the proposed uh, boundary treatment, including the uh, fence and hedging. Now on to the um, a manor house itself. Uh, you've got the um, existing proposed basement plans. Um, as you can see, no, no, no changes proposed to the um, plan form or the historic fabric, it's, um, you just got to see uh, the necessary pipe work um, leading to the plant room. Again, the uh, elevations of the um, of, of, of Manor House. The, uh, the pipe work will be connected underground, so there'll be no um, above ground uh, external alterations to the house. So here, here we've got a aerial view. Um, you can see the uh, the, the tree cover surrounding uh, Manor House and um, and St Michael's Church as well to the north. And th this is the, the land in question uh, that um, referred to in the application as the paddock, also known as, as the park. So here, here we've got some photographs. Top left is 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 this this is a photograph. Um, Taken uh, last summer, actually. Um, th th this is the um, looking to the top left one is the image standing roughly where the proposed um, at the edge of, of the proposed uh, PV array, um, and that's looking towards the uh, church and the building. The bottom right um, image is uh, is a view of of Whitson Lodge, which is um, a property immediately to the north of the development site. Uh, it's considered to be non-designated heritage ter asset due to its um, uh, Victorian, well, well-maintained Victorian character. And I've got some photographs um, taken more recently, um, close up of the of the site, the location of the PV array. The bottom right is is, is these are both um, standing from the adjacent uh, main road. Uh, the bottom right is is facing um, uh, across uh, across from east to east to west, facing um, with with the uh, boundary hedge, with the adjoining property on the right. 
got more photographs um, further down. <coughs> Top left photograph there is looking towards uh, uh, the manor house um, itself. And this is uh, a photograph from the, from the s southeastern end. The uh, application is recommended for approval for the reasons outlined in the report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have several speakers on this one. And just a reminder, this is a listed buildings consent as well as a planning application, so we have double time. Um, so I think we have Councillor Philippa Padgett. Welcome back to speak first, if you'd like to go ahead when you're ready. Thank you. Yes, Philippa Padgett, um, councillor um, of um, Compton Dando Parish Council. Um, Compton Dando Parish um, consists of five villages. The villages are represented by um, uh, councillors who live in those villages. Thus, the unanimous decision to object was reached by councillors from, from a wider area than just Burnet itself. Um, our parish is rural and um, spans the Chew Valley. Um, the parish council would have liked to support the application because it addresses the climate emergency, but felt the location of the solar panels was totally inappropriate. The um, solar panel array will cause adverse visual impact on the green belt, which is unacceptable. Um, some of the photos that you saw just then are quite hard to tell because you just see a, lot, a mass of green, but I don't know, have, I'm not sure if councillors have visited to, to know. Um, but if you, when you are there, it, it is, the, the, the cottages look a lot closer and the other, other um, dwellings, you know, the dwellings in the village. Um, um, the parish council felt that it was significantly changing the visual setting of uh, Burnett Village as a whole um, to have the siting of the panels where proposed. Um, the proposed site for the solar panels is a sensitive area adjacent to the iconic old schoolhouse known as Whitson Lodge and Burnett Church and the Manor House itself, which are listed buildings. Councillors were of the opinion that the historic open parkland setting of the Manor House would be lost if this de development was allowed, and that panels, security fence and high hedging would be highly visible from both the homes in the village and from the B3116. The park, as it is known, not paddock, forms the approach to the village and this open area of grassland and trees has formed parkland for generations. It's significant in the character and setting of the village of Burnett as a whole and in particular the wider setting of the manor house. This was not addressed in the heritage statement which only noted the view from St Michael's Church, the view from the manor house. The particular special circumstances of the need for renewable energy is not outweighed do not outweigh the detrimental impact of the green belt. Councillors were in, in agreement that it was important for solar panel location to be considered fully and not to set the precedent that renewable energy installations were allowed almost anywhere, especially when there may be more discrete alternatives either for siting unobtrusively or more discrete choice of materials as this is coming forward at the moment. Thus, to borrow the phrase, right tree, right place, when looking at planting tree schemes for um, the um, a climate emergency, in this context, right renewable, right place. Um, the parish council supported the ground source heat, source heat pump um, because it has no, no detrimental effect. Siting is important. The value of the renewable energy must not be ex at the expense of historic environment or green belt, for example. We hope that, um, that you will see our, our um, thinking on this and we'll be able to, to um, um, refuse this permission. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. If you wouldn't mind vacating your seat to allow uh, Richard Arthur to come to the front table uh, as the next two speakers are sharing their time. That's right. So, so, uh, could, so you are sharing your I'm time. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. 
I wondered so, if it was better without hearing the microphone. Okay, so you are sharing your time, is that correct? I wasn't aware of that. I would prefer to have my three minutes, please. I would also like to draw attention. Oh, right, you have three, three minutes each, which Perfect. is sharing your time, because there's six minutes. Perfect, thank you very much indeed. So, um, as you have your microphone on, Richard Arthur, would you like to go first? Thank you very much. Uh, firstly, I'm very grateful to Mr. Patrick for including my recent words and photographs in the planning application. Unfortunately, these are not shown here, and this would show a mock-up of where the panels were, which I think would give the councillors a much better idea of why we are concerned about this. I have lived in, the, well, next year I will have lived in Burnett for 40 years, and for every one of those years I have sought to get Burnett designated a conservation area, and failed. Whilst I realise that there is no guarantee of protection, the lack of such status is mentioned in this planning. Renewable energy is not the question here for me, and today, more than ever, such, such uh, schemes are important, and, uh, but they can and must be sympathetic. If passed, the above ground part of this scheme, the PV, will be in, in such a sensitive loc area will set a terrible precedent. I want to make it clear from the outset that this is, this is about wanting to be positive about alternative energy wholeheartedly, but not if we trash one priceless piece of our environment and heritage to try and save another. If the idea is to popularize alternative energy, I would urge everyone to consider that this choice of location will have exactly the opposite effect. Personally, I can think of no better way to galvanize those who feel that despoiling our heritage, villages and countryside is an unacceptable cost than a highly objectionable profile that this eyesore will create. The loss of democracy and the loss of heritage at Burnett and the loss of goodwill for the council will be a tragic re result of this, especially as sympathetic solar schemes can be produced, such as the very large solar array which Burnett already has and which everyone can fully support because it is so hidden, I very much doubt whether many people know it even exists. The ground source heat pump will be immediately hidden um, in, in, in underground and so won't be a problem. Equally, there are many ways in which an appropriate PV array could be hidden from the outset. I believe that my document, which I'd love you to see, uh, would speak for itself, uh, um, and the mock-up shows that this uh, array will be a totally alien in an edifice, full of view, in full view along a quarter of the kilometre of the B3116, which runs alongside the park. This grassland forms a quintessentially English open vista towards the listed church and manor house and the village. The photo also shows clearly how the view from Whitson, Old, the view from Whitson Lodge will be blighted in this permanent eyesore. The elderly owners of this house asked the applicant politely that the installation could be moved at least slightly away from the road out of their view. But quite unbelievably, this reasonable, practical and equitable solution was met with a wholly inappropriate rebuke. Despite the ward councillor emailing a bizarre statement to me recently referring to uh, the views of an unspecified number of residents, I speak for the vast num majority of Burnett and others. Could I, sorry, could I ask you to bring your comments to a close, please, Certainly. if your time is up? This is not a case of not in my backyard, it's, not, it's in the case of not in everyone's front yard, front yard for generations to come. I, very, I urge at the very least the decision, if it's passed, uh, is to stipulate a transplanted fully mature, full height, instant, uh, mature hedge. And I do not know why I have not been notified from this planning application okay, uh, or the planning application that was thank, previously thank you. joining my vision. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, when you're ready, Rosemary Turner, please. Naturally, our objection is the close proximity to our home, Whitson Lodge. During the winter months, when the trees and hedges have shed their leaves, we can see right through to what will be a very ugly sight for us. The positioning of the proposed PV panels are as far away from the manor as possible, and we feel there has been no meaningful consideration of the impact on the manor's neighbours. This is demonstrated by the fact that the planning application stated, neighbours contacted, but this was formally submitted two days prior to us being informed by the applicant who notified us all on the Burnett Village WhatsApp group. Sustainable energy is the way forward, 
but there is a place for it, and the proposed site is most unsuitable, especially for an installation of this size. Please ask yourselves, would I want this next to my property? The applicant clearly doesn't, as he has already admitted to us. However, the greatest objection of all is the detrimental visual effect that the installation of these ugly PV panels will have upon the village and its approach. The park is a frontage to the beautiful Elizabethan facade of the Grade II Manor House, the 12th century St. Michael's Church and Whitson Lodge, the Victorian School. These three buildings are the most prominent historical structures of the village as you drive along the B3116 and the proposed PVs will have a negative impact on the open space between these buildings and present a terrible first impression of Burnett from the road. We are very disappointed that the elected ward councillor's stance, as in the Five Villages Parish Plan of 2020, the parishioners' wishes have been ignored. In the summary, I quote, there is a very strong feeling that the overall character of the parish should be preserved, both in the built and natural environments. There is significant support for preserving the look and the ambiance of the area, which is in the green belt of Bath and North East Somerset. Particular value is placed on the wildlife, countryside access and tranquility of the whole area. Burnett spent 400 years under the ownership of the church and the next 400 years under Bristol Municipal Charities after the village was bequeathed by John Whitson. This legacy has helped to create a microcosm of unchanged rural England and an atmosphere of continuity, which in a rapidly changing world is something very worth preserving Please do not allow Burnett's heritage to be lost forever. Thank you very much. Uh, if you could come and sit back behind me and can I invite Hilary Oliver and Councillor Alistair Singleton to the front, please. Okay, uh, Hilary Oliver, when you're ready, just press, put, turn your mic on and start. Good afternoon, I am the applicant. Thank you for allowing me to speak and to Alistair for his explanation, which he will give in due course, of why this project is so important. The Baines journey to net zero plan states, the inclusion of the climate and ecological emergency as one of our core policy themes demonstrates our commitment to do what is needed to overcome this challenge. This policy was important when written and looks even more prescient now given the current world geopolitical issues and with local oil suppliers rationing domestic oil to local people. We bought the Manor House in August 2019 after it had been on the market for two years so we're not responsible for the planning applications before that date. We are acutely aware of the house's status as a heritage asset and our responsibilities to future generations to look after it. We have installed insula insulation, draft proofing and secondary glazing. Dealing with the heating is the next step to making the house carbon neutral and thereby ensuring it keeps pace with climate change requirements and has a future as a dwelling. We have always had a strong interest in the environment, the community and equality. We have been members of Friends of the Earth since our 20s. You can see how old we are now. We support local businesses in our purchasing choices, particularly for food, and we've brought back into use the kitchen garden and greenhouse. Since moving to the area, we've both volunteered with COVID vaccinations at a surgery in Bristol. We're active in our support of cycling, rugby, the theatre and music in Bath and Bristol, and we contribute financially to St Michael's Burnett. In addition, we are very conscious of the opportunities and advantage that our population cohort, the baby boomers, have enjoyed, and also that a lot of the things that the baby boomers have done have compromised the opportunities and environment for subsequent generations. 
Many baby boomers think that the future can be a continuation of the past, which from an environmental point of view, it can't. Change is required. This project will not generate a financial return for us at all. In fact, we will probably end up making a contribution in excess of £100,000 to protecting the environment. We started the planning process in May 2021 with the PPA and we have followed the guidance given at every stage. 70% of Baines is green belt. Nine applications for ground mounted solar panels on the green belt have been approved by Baines, including one in Burnett that was referred to earlier. The key issues have always been harm to the green belt and delivery of special benefits. We have chosen the corner site not idly, not by having a whim, but because we were informed by the uh, consultants that we were working with that A, it was as far away from the village as possible, and B, that it is the best place for the sun. Solar panels do involve having the sunlight on it. It also meant that we had to use, uh, lose the least number of trees. We will be putting a mature hedge of native species around the panel. And when we say mature, we're going to start pretty big and hopefully they'll grow fairly quickly. But we will do other things to shield it in the meantime. So it will blend with the existing boundary head, hedge. So the compound will look like part of the existing hedge and will not stand out. The new hedge will be 2.4 meters high, the same height as the existing hedge, and will improve the environment for wildlife. The panels will not be visible to anybody standing at ground level or from any houses to the south, which are at least 150 metres away and also hidden by several trees. The compound will be 740 square metres out of 250 million square metres of green belt in Baines. As I said, it is the optimal location for maximising the efficiency of the panels and protecting trees while minimising the impact on the green belt and heritage assets. Any other location would make the panels less efficient and the compound more obvious and visible to other houses in the village. All the expert consultees and the planning officer agree that this is the case. The conservation officer in his report, written after the parish council meeting and receipt of new information, said, revised heritage statement provides a convincing justification. The planning officer says in his report to the committee, it is considered that the siting and design adequately mitigates harms to the openness and amenity of the green belt. He goes on to say, positioning the installation adjacent to the northern boundary and the hedge that runs along it is considered the least intrusive location within the parkland. We have provided detailed explanations of how we will be saving over 20 tonnes of CO2 every year by using 8,000 litres less oil every year. For context, 10 small cars, each doing 10,000 miles per annum, produce 20 tonnes of CO2. So this project delivers CO2 saving more quickly, easily, and with less strain on the public purse than any other alternative. It, the conclusion of the planning officer in his report was, it is considered that the outlined energy benefits of the proposals outweigh the in principle harm of the green belt subject to consideration of the openness. This project fits perfectly within the Baines policy of local generation and storage. So in summary, it will enhance the viability of a listed asset for future generations. The location of the solar panels and screening with hedges means that there is negligible impact on heritage assets and Burnett Village. The use of solar panels and batteries protects the stretched energy system. It is supported by all the independent expert consultees and the planning officer. The use Could you of the bring your comments to close, please? I will. The use of the exceedingly small amount of green belt that is already compromised by being next to a busy road is fully justified by the benefit of saving over 20 tonnes of CO2 a year for the benefit of our children and our grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you. If you could turn your mic off, please, and count the singleton when you're ready. Thank you, Chair. I will be brief. The applications before you this afternoon are important. They clearly impact on a village community and its surroundings, but they also represent a case where opinion is divided and emotions have come into play. 
This is a case of a type we will all, I am sure, see much more of in the coming months. There is an inherent tension between a natural desire to conserve and preserve a beautiful and much loved spot and the simple realities of the modern world we live in. Baines, as you know, declared a climate emergency in 2019 and to set a challenging ambition to achieve net zero by 2030. A key element of achieving that resides in a rapid increase in the number, scale, and complexity of renewable energy installations across the district. That makes sense not only as a way of reducing our use of fossil fuels, but also in terms of efficiency, as up to 10% of all electricity generated is lost in transmission. Beyond Baines, the government, the IPCC, and the United Nations Secretary General, amongst others, are in harmony in warning of the seriousness and speed of the climate and carbon challenge we face, and flagging up the need to wean ourselves off fossil fuels. Current geopolitical events only serve to emphasize the instability and fragility of traditional energy markets and the implications for us all in energy insecurity and pricing pressures. Baines as a council is taking a lead in creating a planning regime and culture which can effectively handle these demands. The applications we are now addressing are for the installation of a ground source heat pump with the associated solar panels and battery infrastructure to run it effectively and opti optimize its operating efficiency. It is a well-designed and impressive project and Mr. and Mrs. Oliver are to be commended both for the professionalism of the way they have gone about it and for the resource they have committed to the task. The file shows that they began by taking pre-application advice from the council and have now worked their application through the system, working with the council's officers to satisfy the various requirements and demands made of them. In turn, each of the council's conservation, archaeological, highways, ecological, and arbor arboricultural specialists has been satisfied, sometimes with conditions attached. There has been opposition, as will, you will have seen. And this is not a case of nimbyism. There are a number of genuinely held concerns, very often framed within a caveat that the objector supports renewable energy per se, but is concerned about an aspect of this scheme. In almost every case, the nature or siting of the proposed solar panels. Generally, the comments are thoughtful and considered, but in one or two cases, they are surprisingly immoderate or extreme. What the file does not reflect, and you will be familiar with this phenomenon from other cases you have dealt with in the past, where there are controversial or innovative schemes in smaller communities, is the voice of quiet content. A number of villagers have taken the opportunity to express their support to me, but preferred not to raise their heads above the parapet by going public. The officer's report tackles the issue of the sighting of the panels head on, and I quote, positioning the installation adjacent to the northern boundary and the hedge that runs along it is considered the least intrusive location within the parkland, factoring in its open viewpoints from the public realm and the setting of listed buildings. Many of the objections center on Whitson Lodge and the impact the development may have on it and on Mr. and Mrs. Turner who live there, and we've just heard very movingly from Mrs. Turner. The report considers this less than substantial harm and further comments, it is considered that the sustainability benefits of the development outweigh this harm. It is important that the conditions suggested in the report are complied with to ensure that no unwitting or negligent harm is done to the archaeological or natural environments and that the required tree planting and creation of a proper hedge of appropriate mixed native species take place. The professional approach that Mr. and Mrs. Oliver have taken so far, I suggest, gives no concern that this is likely. If the project goes ahead, the saving of 20 tons of CO2 a year 
the equivalent of what 1,008 mature trees would absorb, achieved, not to mention 8,000 litres of heating oil not burned, there is a significant win for our communities, both local and further afield. It is the sort of scheme that we will see more of in the future and will be a pioneer installation for Baines. Officers have examined the application in minute professional detail and weighed it carefully in the legal and planning contexts. The recommendation is to permit, and I believe that that is both a fair and a balanced outcome. I also believe that it's right. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Singleton. Would you both like to come and sit back down behind me? And do we have any questions for the officer, please? Councillor Hughes. Thank you. So, I, first of all, I had a couple of questions, but I just wanted to clarify these numbers, make sure I understand them. So, the, um, the PV panel array is going to generate 32,000 kilowatt hours per annum, roughly. 32.217, but 32, okay, of which 20,000 20, of that is required to, to, to run the ground source heat pump, which leaves us with a balance of 11,000 kilowatt hours surplus. So how much of that surplus, I, know, I understand that they're saying that a, sur a surplus of this will go back into the grid. So do we know what the surplus is going to be, roughly, that's going back into the grid? Um, I'm afraid I don't have the, the, the uh, figure for that. Um, so, so we can only speculate on, on, okay. on I mean, that, I'm afraid. The reason I ask the question, because I'm just trying to establish whether this is the right size for this particular development, or whether this is perhaps a, a smaller, more discrete system that didn't put power back into the grid would be more suitable in this particular instance. Um, would you be able to also just, I mean, I've, sorry if I missed all of this from the presentation, um, could you clarify the, the, the actual size of the, of the array, the total diameter size of the array, and the distance from both the manor house and from the nearest residential property? Right, so the, the array, um, it, it covers, it's, a, it's a square um, uh, 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 sort of site and it's um, 714 square metres um, in area. So I'll just try, I'll go back to have the... You got, sorry, have you got the actual, the overall, the dimensions? The dimensions. Um, I can't picture those, that mm -hmm. square meterage in my head. I, it's just... Length and width. Um, I, sorry, I don't have the I don't have the dimensions to hand. I'm afraid. Sorry. So, okay. Um, I said, I'm just literally trying to get a head, an idea in my head of the actual scale of this array, if it were placed in a field, and I'm struggling to do that from the information available. And, and the sorry, could I? Sorry, sorry. I'll have to ask you to leave the room if you... Thank you. Just leave the officer to find the information. If it's the square at the top of the diagram, isn't it? It's this square here, yeah. That, that's the outline for the uh, security fencing and, and yeah. I mean, that, that, I was, I'm okay. afraid I haven't got the actual um, okay. figures to hand, but that that's hopefully gives you okay, more so of a perspective. Could, so with the second part of the question mm -hmm. then was, can you 
tell me how far away that is from the nearest residential property and how far away it is from the manor house that it's serving? Well, it's, um, I mean, it's, it's, it joins a boundary with Whitson Lodge, so it, it's, um, it's essentially, you, you'd have the security, you'd have a security fence, then the, uh, uh, the boundary hedge, and then the actual boundary with Whitson Lodge. Um, Unfortunately, I'm afraid I haven't got, haven't got the figures to hand in terms of the actual distance from the from the uh, manor house. So it's it, it, okay, and it's it's basically it's, it's more likely to be viewed from the adjacent properties than the, than the manor house it's serving. Mm. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Davis. Uh, my question was answered about the size compared to what they needed. Okay, so that's already been asked, Councillor Bromley. Thank you, Chair. Um, the applicant said that, that the, this was the best location, but I just wondered if, if there were any other locations had been considered and, and um, if, if they were discounted, why, were they, why they were discounted, really? Um, uh, it's, it's an issue that I did raise at, at, at pre-application stage, and um, I, haven't, um, I haven't had any sort of explicit um, consideration of actual alternative sites um, uh, as, as, as it's been discussed um, during this um, uh, during, the, during the comments this is this is the, this is the sighting that will have the greatest impact in terms of uh, solar gain uh, with, with the least amount of disruption to uh, trees um, and also it's um, it's, it, it's it's sighted furthest away from from both um, Manor House and uh, St Michael's Church, um, so and, and that was that, that was sort of the the, uh, the the mindset of, of, of the case officers. Um, but in terms of um, demonstration that alternative sites have been provided, that's not really that hasn't been provided. All right, Councillor Hodge. Sorry, just building on the same theme. So in terms of the, the, the big area in the red boundary, that the area of the PV, which is 700 metres squared, which I approximate to, you know, an equivalent of seven metres by 100 metres is, is 700 metres squared. Um, as the officer, can you explain again why that particular corner, that six, that's, it's only 6% of a, Big area. There's no. We don't have any trees drawn on there. Why that particular corner? You felt would uh, catch more sunlight. Is, is there really trees throughout the site? Um, and, and the other point I wanted to ask about is the the picture of the array. There seems to be a big gap between the two strips of solar panels. Um, I mean, surely they could have been put or more closely together. I don't know, is, is it necessary to have the big gap? And secondly, and, and then my final question is, that, is that, does put it the, um, is this seen as a better solution to, is there non-visible roof space on the roof of the manor, manor house that could have been used? Um, so, so first, of, in, in terms of the first question, uh, this, um, hopefully this, this image here um, sort, sort of clarifies somewhat. Um, there is, uh, with, with a proposed sighting, um, only one uh, one tree would be required to be removed um, by placing it in that top northeast corner. Um, as you can see, the, the trees are sort of dotted around uh, the park. Um, there is a bit of a space more to the centre, but we, we, uh, it's the officer's opinion that by placing the, the uh, um, the array sort of more within the centre of, of 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 the field that that would have a more harmful impact, um, even accounting for the uh, proposed uh, um, screen hedging. In fact, uh, and, and as well, it was a consideration that the the this this boundary, um, while the while the, the surrounding uh, boundaries joining the highway uh, would um, be served. With, you know, it's, it's more open, but the um, the boundary hedge uh, along this northern boundary here w would allow for, s for some degree of continuity by providing that screen hedging. Um, 
So in terms of the in terms of a question about the um, uh, whether whether it's been explored in terms of the, uh, uh, the the roof of Manor House, um, that hasn't there hasn't been a lot that, ha that hasn't really been explored in in great detail. But I, I, I personally find it hard to imagine that um, an array of this sort of scale could be provided within Manor House without. Um, significant detriment to the character and significance of, of the listed building, e even accounting for any sort of internal valleys. I just don't imagine that there's the scope for that. And, and so I think I missed a question. Sorry, and the final yeah. question was that the, the, the array of the panels, um, those, it looked like two, like 100 metre tracks, two, two arrays oh, yes. of three yeah. with a, a gap in between them. Why is it spread out in that way at a particular angle? Again, that's just to, to ensure maximum uh, solar gain. So, that, so the, the reason it's angled in, in that, I'll, I'll just find the right drawing. And there's a kind of, there's a big mm -hmm. gap between the two arrays. Is there a particular reason? You know, the sun comes straight down. There's a, there's a quite a, is that necessary then? To, is that a big track in between them? Could they have been put more closely together? Uh, I, as far I, I don't know actually um, I, I, I'm not I'm not um, I'm not an expert in, in terms okay. of the uh, um, the requirements I mean no, the, the, I would expect them to need um, some some form of gap because because they are sensitive to uh, um, any, any sort of uh, obstruction and, uh, and so I imagine there would be a gap required of, uh, somewhat um, and the as you can see the um, the reason, the reason that the, the, the array, the panels are angled in this fashion is it's, it's directly due south. So uh, does that benefit? Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Any more questions, Councillor Clark? Um, could you just clarify for me, has the application for the listed building consent, which is associated with this uh, application, um, What's the status of that, and what's the implication should the, it not be approved to have the, the, the um, listed building built, listed built, um, you know, fixed with this uh, going in? Well, the, the two applications are to be sided uh, uh, together. So, um, it, although the listed building consent, in, in terms of what requires consent under that application, really relates to the direct impacts on the listed building, which which um, um, haven't, haven't, uh, haven't, haven't raised the um, uh, level of controversy of the, of the, of the PV array, um, we would expect the two to be determined together because without, the, without the, the solar PV array, the ground source heat pump probably wouldn't be viable in terms of that, you know, just, just looking at the energy figures. Um, and also that would, you know, it all, it's all part of one, one project. So without, this, without the solar panels, um, it, it would it, it would throw out the uh, list of building consent uh, works. Yeah, I, just a clarification then. So we mm -hmm. should we question should we be considering not just the impact in the green belt of this solar panel, but also the impact on a listed building? That's correct. Uh, is that yeah. What we're doing? yeah. Okay. Councillor McPhee. I think the first speaker. Uh, said that there were possibly some developments um, in the uh, makeup of, of the solar arrays so that they were not so glaring, etc. I wondered if you had any comment on that. And the other thing was, um, it's not quite clear to me how high they go, but the, the hedgerow that the applicant is going to grow will, will mean that the... Um, the apparatus will n not be visible from the road and not be visible from next door. That, that, that correct. That is the intention, and, and that is, um, as, as my recommendation suggests, that would be controlled via condition. We would expect um, a, a satisfactory um, specification of, of um, hedge planting, including heights and, and species. Uh, to be provided um, at, at the relevant stage, and, and that would be that would that, would, that, would, that must be um, 
uh, installed as as part of the uh, um, uh, the, the approved development. So, so as uh, I mean, hopefully this 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 section here um, should should help sort of clarify that. But the in intention is that the the hedge w will exceed the height of of both the the, uh, the panels and the security fencing. Okay, any more questions before we move to the debate? Councillor Hughes. Sorry, I, I did, I, sorry if, you, if you've mentioned it, but so how big does that hedge have to be to obscure, completely obscure it from view? Well, I mean, from ground view, as long as it exceeds the height of... I mean, there's, there's, there's two issues. One is the height of the fence, and the other is, it's, is obviously its density, so, it's, um, so that you, you, you can't... Um, uh, see through it. Um, with the latter, I think that would have to be controlled in, in terms of the, the planting specification and the species. Um, but the height, in order to, to fully ob obscure it um, at, at ground level, that then the proposed height would achieve that. Have you got a number and, uh, for the heights? I mean, it's two, two and a half metres was, was, is a proposed height for the hedge. Okay, just that hedges work both ways. They obscure that, they also obscure people's views. So, uh, two and a half metres. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Councillor Hodge. Sorry, Chair, just one more quick question. I just wanted to check the location. Is it, am I correct in understanding, you might have said this already, but it, is it driven again by the curtilage of a listed building in terms of planning? It has to be away from the curtilage. The curtilage of a listed building makes it need to be distant from the listed house, but as a consequence, it's close to a non-listed house. Yes, that, that was a consideration um, in terms of not, not, not just the distance alone, but uh, minimising the impacts on the setting of views from the listed building and towards the listed building. And, okay. and, and then that would have carried more weight than, than the impact on any non-designated assets. Okay. No more questions. We can move to the debate, and I'll turn to Councillor Hounsell once again. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, right, I'm Councillor Duncan Hounsell. I'm uh, also a uh, ward councillor for Salford Ward, in which this uh, location lies. Uh, as we've uh, heard and read, um, this application has generated uh, strong opinions. Um, can I just remind everybody that we should always be courteous and respectful of others, even if they have and hold different opinions. Um, the, uh, uh, again, we have to consider the application that's in front of us. There's been a number of comments suggesting that, you know, alternatives, but, but it's not our place to, um, uh, we're not in a position to, uh, uh, to change an application. Uh, we're looking at the application in front of us and the applicant is perfectly entitled to put, uh, propose a scheme uh, that goes through the planning process. Um, there have been a number of, uh, uh, of ob objections, um, but as I said this morning in, when we were talking about the resourceful earth uh, uh, application, uh, the, the planning process is not, not a referendum. That, that it, uh, it, these things have to be decided on planning matters and, and the overall planning balance. There's been, there, there is so much about this that's a, uh, that depends on uh, the, 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 the visual impact. And I've just noted a few things. Um, people have referred to the harm to the parkland setting, the harm to the setting of the village, the, the harm to the setting of Whitson Lodge and other buildings, the visual impact in Greenbelt, the effect on openness, the visibility from, from the highway, CPRE have talked about the adverse visual impact, um, uh, the, uh, the immediate neighbor uh, is concerned that the view uh, from their property will be uh, significantly affected in an adverse way. Um, Councillor Paget, when she addressed us, used the phrase, when you are there. Uh, Councillor Hughes used the phrase, I can't picture this. Uh, so what I'm getting round to is my motion is to propose a site visit. Thank you, Councillor Hounsell. Do I have a seconder for that? Councillor Bromley? Yes, thank you. I'll check. I'll second that. 
Okay. Thank you, Councillor Hounsfield. Any more contribution to the debate, please? Yeah. Councillor Clark. Um, yes, because I, um, uh, irrespective of that, I do think we should actually uh, consider what's before us now. I, I would like us to anyway. Um, it does seem to me if this was, this is in the green belt, and if the applicant was uh, putting forward the, the building of a house, there's no way we would approve it. Um, I, I look at these solar panels, which I personally think are unsightly and understand why people don't like. No, I would never be persuaded that solar panels, either in a field or in a house, are a beautiful thing. Um, and it does surprise me how it, uh, it becomes that solar panels are given the nod on, on many occasions when, as I say, I, I think they have a blot on the, on the landscape. Uh, so be that as it may, I think I'm right in saying if this was a house uh, uh, for, for application to build a house we, in the green belt, uh, covering this, this amount of uh, area, we would not approve it, even if it was a, a bungalow. Um, what I would also uh, say to anybody that uh, has fields or land of, of this size and bigger, don't just think about 2030, which is a politi politically expedient target, which won't be met, no matter how many jumping up and down we do. Think about Chair, next, Chair, uh, this is not appropriate because the, the, we will be discussing this at the next uh, the planning next, meeting. Sorry, can I, can I finish? The uh, next? Yeah, uh, we, we should be can I just, voting, yeah, can I just voting finish? on the site visit. Can, but, if, we, yeah. if we could just concentrate on um, not just on the short term, because that is a short term measure, the next 30 to 50 years and planting English oaks in this area would be beneficial in the long term. So all I'm saying is consider alternatives to short-term gains, particularly when they're po politically expedient. And having just had this gentleman tell us about uh, Chair, being polite to each other, yeah, I, sorry, would but, but, uh, wait, I would have liked one, it if he not um, um, interrupted me. No, Councillor Clark, the problem is, and he's quite right, and, and, and I should have pointed that out, once a site visit has been proposed, then further debate should be on the matter of the site visit, because we should be having this debate in the next meeting. So Chair, I didn't, fair think, comment. I, I didn't think it, with a proposal for site visit, I thought we went straight to the vote on that. That's what I've just said. You, no, you no you we, can, said we can debate on the matter of the site visit. So, Councillor Hughes, you had your hand up. Is this about the site visit? Well, partly, yeah, but I mean, a debate is a debate, and I understand that we've now, we're now going to vote. We haven't yet decided if we're going on a site visit. Um, no, which is why we're not supposed to debate on anything else, well, because we'll vote on the site visit, and if that falls, okay, but, um, then we can debate on other things. Okay, well, my point is that the site visit will, will help with me to understand certain concerns that I have, but not all of them. So I would like, if possible, the officer to look into some before the next meeting. Uh, well, you can certainly, you can, you, ab, ab, if we go on site because visit, I'm you can email the officer and ask him to come to the next meeting armed with information if you feel as short of it. Sorry, I'm not taking any more, but we need to vote on the site visit. Sorry. This is about the site visit. Okay, carry on. Yeah. I shall make my site visit on the way home tonight. Okay. Fine. So, we have a motion on the table for a site visit proposed by Councillor House and seconded by Councillor Bromley. All those in favour, please. That's six in favour. Against. Two against. Abstentions. What? One. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. One. So that is carried. Thank you. I'm sorry if I didn't call that strictly enough. My mistake. So we've been going for um, nearly an hour and a half, so let's have a five minute break. I know we've only got one more to do, but if you don't just stretch your legs.
Everybody? Okay, so um, thank you, committee members. It's been quite a difficult day. Um, one more to go, which is uh, 16 Broadlands Avenue in Canesham. Uh, if I could ask the officer to do a presentation, please. Thank you, Chair. Yep, this is for the erection of a front side and rear extension um, at 16 Broadlands Avenue in Canesham. There's also um, a loft conversion with a dormer and a garden room proposed. So this is the site location plan. Here's Broadlands Avenue and the property outlined in red. Um, it's a semi-detached property. This here is St. Francis Road. And then running along here, which you can't quite see, is St. Ladock Road. Um, this is the property here on an aerial view. So you can just see the properties kind of go around in a semicircle shape in a cul-de-sac. So I've got the existing floor plans next. Um, at the moment, in the back garden, there's, there's a garage at the end of the garden and a shed. And then the ground floor here, first floor, and then roof plan. They've got it second floor, but there's no accommodation on that floor at the moment. And then the proposed floor plans, there's a number of elements. I'll just kind of try and walk you through them all. So this is a new parking area proposed at the front of the property for three car parking spaces. Um, on the main dwelling, there's a front extension here, a two-storey side extension, which is about 1.5 metres in width, um, and then you've got a single-storey rear extension on the back as well. Um, and then you've got a loft conversion with a dormer, so that will add a bedroom um, on the second floor. And then the rear garden, the existing garage and shed will be um, removed and replaced with this garden room, which forms a garden room, store, home office, studio, um, area. Just the proposed block plan as well sort of shows this, shows all the elements a bit more clearly. So you've got the dormer, single storey extension, two storey side extension, front extension and then the garden room to the rear with the parking at the front of the house. So the existing proposed elevations, so you've got a bit of comparison. So at the moment the existing property um, has a hipped roof and a small single storey extension to the rear just goes halfway along. Um, so the proposal is to do a two-storey side extension. Um, the hip will turn to a, to, to a gable. Um, a dormer's proposed on the rear elevation and then a single-storey extension at the back here. <coughs> oh, and the front extension, sorry, on the front there. And then this is the garden room. So the existing garage at the moment is just a single-width uh, garage building. The proposed garden room will be double-width. These windows and doors face into the garden. Um, and then this elevation here faces onto the bat lane and this is where the garage door is proposed to be. So I've got some photos which I hope are quite useful. So this is at the front of the house. So this is the existing property at the moment with the hit roof. This is the neighbouring dwelling. Um, they have a loft conversion at the rear. And then the rear of the property, so you can see the existing single-storey extension here. There's two neighbouring dormers um, close by, and quite a long, it's quite a long plot. You can see the two dormers better in this photo down here, and then this is the other, other neighbour on the other side. And then I've just got some photos of the back lane. So this is coming off St Francis Road as you drive into the lane, um, and then I've walked down the lane taking a few photos, so you can see that there is car access to the rear. This here is the existing garage. Um, so this, the, the applicant owns up to the edge of um, the, the plot here. And again, you can see the garage here actually as well, just facing back down the lane. And then just a couple more of the lanes. So again, the applicant's existing garage here, and then you can see their garage and their shed and the area of land to the front. So the, applicants re uh, the application is recommended for permission for the reasons in the committee report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. And I have got one speaker, which is Councillor Simmons, but he doesn't seem to be here. So we'll move to questions to the officer, please. Anybody got any questions, clarifications? Councillor Hodge. Sorry. Yes, I, hello, sorry, I just had a question about the, um, the impact of light on the neighbour. Um, 
not sure whether you explored that in your report, but it was one of the objections. Um. Yeah, so let me just go back to the rear photos just to show. So obviously they are uh, proposing a number of different elements, so I'll just sort of look at them roughly all in turn. So the first is the single story rear extension. Um, it projects out, I think from memory, around five meters. I'd have to double check that, but I think it's about that. It's roughly in line with the neighboring property. So in terms of this side, I think the impact, you know, in my opinion, is gonna be fairly limited and it's, it's bordering this built form. Um, there would be some shadowing the other way, but there's, there's this built form here already. Um, and you know, it's, it's at single story, it's fairly limited height. So in my professional opinion, it's, it's acceptable. Um, the two-storey element on the side, just show this photo, will come out here. There will be um, a small, uh, almost path down the side of the property, so it's not going right up to the edge of the boundary. Um, so yes, it will it will decrease some of the light to this to this window here. Um, but again, it's my professional opinion that the it, it's not going to be a significant impact. Um, there are other sort of two-storey extensions in the street. Um, in terms of the dormer, again, I don't think you know that's gonna cause kind of major shadowing given its position um, in the roof. So in my opinion, it's not gonna cause significant loss of light, but obviously that's for the committee to decide and is a matter of planning judgment. Okay, Councillor Hodge. Yeah, any more questions, Councillor Jackson? Yeah, I, I'm minded of an, another application we had that came in and it wasn't clear until we did a site visit um, just how much that particular extension fitted in with, because all the other houses were extended. Would I be right in thinking that although if you look at this thing as of course we should do, plain cold bricks and mortar, it does seem an awful lot that they're doing and could be argued to be over development of the site. But in fact, the neighbor has already um, done a similar extension. And, and could I, would I be right in thinking that up and down the road, you would find very similar dormers and developments? Yeah, so there are um, a number of dormers in the street. Obviously, I've shown some on the photos. Um, and some properties have had two-story side extensions. Some have had single-story extensions. I mean, there's nothing from memory which is exactly the same as, as this application. Um, and obviously, every application has to be assessed on its own merits. Um, but yes, this isn't a street where there's been absolutely no development at all. There are dormers, extensions, etc. cetera. Um, you know, I, I've obviously looked at that, but looked at this kind of, you know, as I say, on its own merits and consider it to be acceptable. So have you got a follow on? Just another small point. Um, looking at that picture in the back garden, I couldn't quite estimate, is there a slope or is it fairly flat? Yeah, let me... Yeah, so here you can see on the side elevation, this is the garden room, it's not particularly clear, but there is, there is a slight slope to the garden. Um, it's, it's relatively flat though, so it's, not, it's nothing too extreme. Okay, any more questions? Councillor Hodge. Just uh, um, addressing the rear, the rear lane um, objections, so that, that, that the structure might block the rear lane or block access to other um, other neighbours. Um, there does seem to be quite a lot of comments about that. Yeah, so I've actually been down the rear lane here twice now. Um, there are a lot of outbuildings, garages, and as you can see here, actually, a number of people are already parking their cars in this rear lane. So it is used by a number of properties, both those backing onto it from Broadlands Avenue and St. Ladock Road. Um, the, the proposed garden room will be located within the uh, applicant's plot. That, you know, that there is obviously the risk that during construction, for example, there may be some you know, construction vehicles, but it's not a development of a scale where we would generally ask for a construction management plan. Um, you know, we would expect contractors to follow sort of best practice guidance and, and not block the rear lane. Um, you know, it, it's going up to the edge of the plot. It shouldn't, it shouldn't impact other people getting in and out of their car parking spaces, etc. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councillor Hughes. So I'm just trying to understand more about the, I mean, obviously we've got Kingston um, Council objecting. We've got 17 other um, objections. 
Is there any particular aspect of this that those 17 were more concerned about than any of the others? Um, I'm not sure. Either. There are a number, number of objections which I've summarised in the committee report. I mean, I think a lot of them were to do with uh, overdevelopment of the site, overlooking and, and the rear lane issue. They seem the main ones to me, but they are outlined and addressed in the committee report. Okay. Anything else? No? We move to the debate. Councillor Clark, I think you're a board councillor. Um, I would like to propose a site visit. Do we have a seconder for that, please? Hodge? Yes, I'm happy to second that. Yeah. Uh, any further comments on the site visit? I'm going to get this clarified before the next meeting. No? Okay, so the motion we have before us is for a site visit. All those in favour? Six in favour. Against. Two against. Abstentions. Two abstentions. So that is carried. Thank you. Um, right, item nine, appeals reports. Members got any questions or comments on the appeals report? Otherwise, we're asked to note it. Councillor Jackson. Ten out of ten, give the officers a gold star. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it's good, isn't it? Um, it also, you know, endorses the decisions we're making here, so that is good. Um, okay, so finally the date of the next meeting, Wednesday 6th of April. We have site visits on <laughs> Monday the 28th of March, if you could all uh, mark that out in your diaries. And our, Yeah, I think that's the Monday before, 28th of March, yeah. Um, and with that, I'll close the meeting. Thank you all very much indeed. <laughs>